Hello, folks. Welcome to the final episode of, not of the show, of the, the Beef Anniversary. This is, and I, I discussed this in the episode, this is the eighth or ninth year. This is the, the, the ninth year Beef Anniversary, which we st- started recording about midway through last year, maybe like towards the end of last year. I, I don't remember when. I was I was down. I was out. Stuff was left uh, set, sitting and unedited. Um Anyway, this 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 is the ninth year of the Simbi podcast. Um, beef anniversary, if you will. I hate doing these shows, and I'll tell you why. You know, I, I think Court has it right, which you'll hear later on the show. Court Court Siops, um, that when he when he does his full franchise fest for for certain milestones, there's no pressure. It's just him and Matt, you know, doing something together, and that's. And that's fine. I, I think I'm going to do more of the same. Not to copy out the man. I might put a little, little, little twist on there and not go full, full, full franchise. I might, I might go back to this idea, you know, where we celebrate an actor or something for the, the, the or like a series of some kind. I, I don't even know. We'll, we'll see how it goes. But um, coming up this, uh, I think it's April or May. It might be May. We'll be, we'll be starting our tenth year. Of the Simbi podcast, um, of non-consecutive programming, lost shows. But if you've stuck it out with us for this this nine years so far, going into the tenth year, uh, bless you, love you. Um, thanks for listening to the banter and bullshit that uh, goes with this show. This sounds like a real swan song, but it's not. I, I'm, I'm more motivated now than ever to. Um, get content out to you guys I'm, I'm, and I'm very excited about that too uh, but this this show in particular I, I won't go into too many pleasantries as far as like what I've been watching or like reviewing a small thing um, but if you haven't seen Project Wolf Hunting I, I'd recommend a nice violent time with that South Korean picture go 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 check it out um, but yeah this, this show the third part of the anniversary is, is uh, packed and stacked with uh, four Four solid reviews, two shorter ones, two two longer ones. I, I think the one's longer. I don't recall, but um, you'll get the last two um reviews of the Christopher Guest oeuvre uh of so, so far. We always make more, um, which is for your consideration and mascots. Uh, we do those, and I will say this about the show. This is Sans Iris. Uh, this time around, she she wasn't here for this and. I forget what she had going on. I think she was in California, with, with, um, doing California stuff, and possibly meeting up with Mike. Because you know, why, why, why wouldn't you? I don't remember what's going on there. But um, she wasn't here for these reviews. Uh, but you, in, in this episode, you will also get not in this order, mind you, uh, a crippled theater, which me and Ricky were doing for these, and we may continue doing uh, as little side projects. It'd be a lot of fun, I think, uh, where we did this this post-apocalyptic film about teens, you know, fighting a gang or something, sort of, with their little robot uh, called Wire to Kill. Excited for you guys to hear that, because uh, that is a mess of a film that has some potential. And, um, yeah. And finally, the, and, and this is what you'll hear first um, on this particular episode, because Valentine's what was this past Tuesday. Some of you guys may, may not have a sweetie. I'm one of those people, but I have... Lots of people I'm sweet on. Uh, this is this is for the people like that and whoever wants to listen. This is our Valentine's Hangover uh, review of of a special film in both of our lives, and we hope you dig it. Here it is. Really? What about Jill? She was in the mafia. She was in the mafia. Yes, the Cosa Nostra. The whole time we went out, she didn't tell me what she did for a living. Charlie, she was unemployed. She didn't have a job. Well, that's just the perfect cover now, isn't it? All right, all right. What about Pam? She smelled like soup. What does that mean? She smelled exactly like beef vegetable soup. Charlie, you're paranoid. But you weren't there. It's all in your head. No, no. Like no, this. No, no.
She stole my heart and my cat. Betty, Judy, Josie, and those hot pussy cats. They make me horny Saturday morning. Girls of cartoons won't leave me in ruins. I want to be Betty's Barney. Hey, Jane, get me off this crazy thing called love. Uh, hello, folks. This is a special, special segment for for you all, for all you lovers out there, or non-lovers, or um, whatever you did on Valentine's Day. This is this is a Valentine's Hangover review, and I'm very, very proud. Uh, we did one of these long ago, like a few Christmases ago, for a romantic comedy called Just Friends that we both happen to enjoy, and we're going to do it again for this Valentine's Day. The three guys a bone on this this beef anniversary episode. And um, hopefully a boner uh, for another film that we love uh, that has romantic, romantic uh, overtones, psychotic overtones, and obsessive overtones. Uh, we'll, we'll talk all about fucking Charlie's problems in this fucking movie. Uh, so I married an axe murderer we're going to talk about. And to do that, I have enlisted none other than I think the one guy I could talk about this movie with and just roll with it. Uh <laughs> Mr. Jeffrey X. Martin, how you doing, sir? Gary! 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 Please don't put me on blast. I'm on your podcast. I will say words about this film. Iris, get me off to this crazy thing called beef. See, I'm not sure if you've prepared that or not, though, which is amazing. See, that's, uh, I didn't put on blast at all. <laughs> No, that's fine. Hey, dude. How you doing? Yeah, man, I'm doing fine. I'm, uh, I'm glad to, to be... Oh, I'm sorry. I was just saying, I'm ready to talk about this extremely strange film that I happen to love quite a bit. Yeah, if you haven't seen it, we're going to spoil the hell out of it. So uh, this is uh, one of those... From 1993, so I was 12 years old when this came out. And I, I had the VHS. I, I watched it constantly on cable and... Uh, I had an aunt who would scream at me, you know, when Mike Myers' father would scream at, 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 at the kid in this movie constantly about giving him his pants or whatnot. I don't want to scream in the microphone, but, you know, it is what it is. Uh, if you don't know, this film stars Mike Myers, it's Charlie McKenzie, and, and his father as, as well in this movie. Uh, Nancy Travis is Harriet Michaels. Anthony LaPaglia, uh, underrated actor in my opinion. As uh, his friend Tony, uh, Amanda Plummer as as Harry Sorose, uh the amazing Brenda Fricker, uh, we don't appreciate enough, I don't think, as May, Charlie's mom, uh, Heed, Charlie's little brother, as played by Matt Doherty, made known as Averman from the Mighty Duck series, and uh, a, a barrage of, of comedic people that I love so much. Um, <laughs> Charles Grodin shows up in this, Debbie Mazur shows up in this, um, Stephen Wright shows up in this. And of course, um, one of the best Phil Hartman scenes you'll ever see is in this movie. Uh, pissing in his ocular cavities. Oh, so good. Bitch. Uh, bitch. <laughs> Pissed in the bitch's eyes. Uh, this is directed by T- Thomas uh, Shalami, I think it's uh, sounds like, kind of like Salami. Probably. There you go. Sure. We'll call him, <laughs> we'll call him Tommy Salami. Tommy Salami uh, did, did many things for, for TV, like the West Wing and stuff like that uh, later on after this. Uh, Robbie Fox wrote this movie. Um, he wrote stuff such as, ooh, don't don't say Granddaddy Daycare. That's freaking terrible. Why would that be in the, his top credits? That just That just sounds bad, you know. But not a lot, which is unfair. Um, <laughs> he wrote the story for In the Army Now, which is a film I happen to enjoy, too. Um, yeah, I, I'll kick it to X first. Um, give us his general thoughts and before we dissect this, Mother. Um, your history with the film, and what do you think about it, sir? My history with the film is kind of short, really, because I didn't see it in the theater. I really didn't see it until, God, not until I got married to Cootie. I don't know, 13 years ago, I reckon. But I will say this. So I Married an Axe Murderer is the most 90s movie ever to 90s. From the giant cappuccino cup tracking shot at the beginning 
to the constant usage of that There She Goes song, which I think shows up five times, maybe six in this movie, and maybe not even done by the same performers. This is the entire 90s in like an hour and 45 minutes. Like you could watch the entire series of Friends and it wouldn't be as 90s as So I Married an Axe Murder. So if you're looking for a time capsule of that particular era, you've got it right here. Oh, I'm sorry. You're done. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, um, yeah. Like I said, my history with this movie, I, I probably saw it pretty early for probably about 19, like, like probably when I was like 15, I saw this movie. So a couple years after it came out, uh, one, one of those rentals that got rented a lot. And I guess it came to HBO. Um, I, 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 I agree totally with, with the nineties thing is it, all over this movie. You know, right down to the, and I, I looked this up, who does the cover of the, the, the Bay City Rollers song, which is one of my favorite scenes in the movie where, you know, the parents are introduced and they have the Scottish uh, Wall of Fame and um, just dusting it off while that plays. Um, Shut off the Bay City Rollers. The soccer game's about to begin. You know, it's so good. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah the, this is a film that I enjoy because this is a film that I watched before I knew what a relationship was. And now I watch it now as a grown up and it kind of hurts my soul a little bit because, uh, me and Charlie McKenzie have a lot in common. I don't look for the worst in people, but you know, I, I, I look for the, the glass half empty in people. And you know, it's like, what, what, what could go wrong? I, the only law that really matters is Murphy's law, apparently. But, um, <laughs> So it's it's really weird now watching as an adult because in a lot of ways I I, I agree with, with with some of his uh, logic but his logic is bad and so is my logic. <laughs> <laughs> um, his logic is terrible, and there are also a lot of red flags that he willingly ignores while pursuing. Harriet. And that's interesting to me, too. It's just like, there were so many signs not to pursue this human being, but a lot of them were based on the weekly world news. And if that's not the most 90s thing in the world, that that's the catalyst for basically everything that happens in this movie, then I don't know what to tell you. Because here's the thing. Back in the 90s, the Weekly World News was everywhere. You couldn't check out of a grocery without seeing the Weekly World News in this in the stands next to the cash registers. And in fact, somewhere in a box in the shed, we have like a collection of the best Weekly World News articles. And it's like, you know, Bat Boy and Hillary Clinton went to bed with an alien and so did Bill, and it was just like this weird sort of threesome that the aliens had, and we never knew if anything was conceived out of that, but it was there. It was you had to look at that while you were buying, you know, Surge. Yeah. Oh gosh. It, now, now, when, when I say like character flaws, and you're, you're right, X, and what this film does so brilliantly is that you know this this film is basically. He sees this article in the Weekly World News, which his mother calls the paper. You know, she 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 because that paper contains facts. You know, that's what she says. <laughs> that's facts. <laughs> it's facts. Oh gosh, the Garth Brooks juice diet, man. Come on now. You know, the, um, <laughs> Talk but, about the thunder rolls. Yeah, yeah. He, he sees all this stuff in, in just this article that, that she that she shows him and. He starts to see all these things that they have in common that, that she that she has done. You know, she she's from Atlantic City. She 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 keeps mentioning this person Ralph in her sleep, which is one of the guys that got killed by Mrs. X, as it's called. And, and this could be all coincidence, it could not be coincidence. But what this film does so well is you really don't find out until the end. You know, spoiler that it is not Harriet, that it is her sister who is the killer because. You know, all these men were threatening to take her sister away from her, you know. And this was her motive, to, to be an axe murderer, why she killed all these men. Um, I, I just think it's brilliant that you're watching a, a, a film with less care w would, you know, it'd be obvious 30 minutes in that she was a psychopath. And 
I think the rub uh, works so fine in, in this movie. And I think the thing that really redeems this movie for me is that third act when it really becomes kind of an old dark house mystery. You know, when the when the killer is revealed and the innocent person that we thought was you know, hacking people up left and right. They're locked in a closet and it really kind of degenerates into this 1930s, maybe late twenties sort of film. And I love that. It is so good. It's such a fun way to sort of resolve all the stuff that, that doesn't quite work in the movie for me, because we're probably going to disagree on this because I know you said you have a lot of things in common with the Charlie McKenzie character. I think he's the least effective character in the entire film. No, I just mean like character traits. You know, I, I don't look for the bad in people, but I, I do look for the, the glass half empty, you know, situation. Okay. And, okay. You know, and, you know and, what, and, and what, what, what could go wrong here, you know? <laughs> Well, some of the things that can go wrong in this movie are the spin doctors on the soundtrack, because why did that ever happen? Um, and why is he playing with a thigh master? Because it's 1993. That's my only answer for that. That you know. is the only answer. <laughs> oh, that's it. What does Charlie do for a living? I, 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 I hope he has some kind of day job that he's not just like doing po- like you know open mic nights at poetry places. I was going to yeah. say, because I know for a fact you don't make any cash doing beat poetry at open mics while drinking expensive coffee elixirs. Yeah, the cappuccino had, maybe... cost, the cappuccino had to cost like eight bucks. I don't know, man. It, it looked like it to be it, $19.93. <laughs> I was going to say 1993 money today to be like $75, and you might get some nutmeg on top of it, and that's it. There's a lot of indoor smoking in this movie, too. And boy, if that's not the 90s, I don't know what is. You could probably still smoke on an airplane at this point. You could smoke on an airplane. You could smoke in... Like a, like a Perkins getting the bottomless cup of coffee, it wouldn't matter. But what's funny about that is Charlie doesn't light his cigarette during his beat poetry bits, even though he's holding one. So like even during like the big say anything moment where he's outside of Harriet's window with his jazz band and his notebook and he's doing the poetry and all those things. He's not even smoking. He's just holding a cigarette in his hand for effect. Now you could like, he could have a laser pointer and it would be the same thing, except, you know, with a cigarette, you get fewer cats. Hot headed harbinger of haggis. Come on now. You know, <laughs> there it is. This poem sucks. I, I stay it for these reasons. I'm sorry. <laughs> It's a, I'm just saying, to me, this is the stuff that's kind of wonky because every other character in this movie I absolutely love. I think Anthony LaPaglia just carries this movie on his weird shoulders. Those bits of him with Alan Arkin where LaPaglia is trying to get him to act like a 70s police chief and start yelling and making racial slurs and stuff. That is gold. Classic comedy gold and i love it and then all of a sudden there's soul asylum and then michael richards is here and i don't know why oh and uh you know, the south side of his own uh the late um they're both late now they're both dead uh, uh haggerty last name uh he, he was an overboard in in everything else um he's the other guy in the newsroom in the, in the newsroom oh crap i forget mike mike, I mike, I mike haggerty that's the guy's name but he's been in everything I, yeah, yeah, yeah. I can see his. Oh, God, was he an overboard too? Yeah, he was. He was. He was Kurt Russell's buddy God, in that movie. God, he's a sweaty carpenter that hates me. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. He was the guy with the panties in the glove compartment. Okay. The the the, the, pan, the, the panty king of elk snout. Okay, come on. <laughs> so, how many times did you count? There she goes in this movie. I swear it was six. And then there was that montage. That felt like it had a lot of scenes that should have been left in the movie because they look cuter than the rest of the movie. Oh, like like where she's like they're like buying the hot dog and stuff, you know? And yeah, they're buying the hot dog, and and Rose, her sister, is there, and they're all laughing and having a good time and stuff. Also, did you not think that this was Amanda Plummer's one big chance to be Carol Kane, and that this... never happened again? She never really stuck the landing all the way, in my opinion. She was going for that, but yeah, yeah, yeah I agree there. And I, mean, I love stuff that she's in. 
I mean, the dumb stuff she's in that I, I love the most, like fucking Free Jack. I could talk about. I could watch Free Jack. Free Jack. Oh, God, and that's I, a good movie. I know it's not a good movie, but you know, I, I I've yes, seen it. Yes, it is. I, I've seen it like ten times. You know, it traditionally isn't a good movie. I guess. I guess you would call it that. <laughs> Okay, fair. Whatever. I think it's a great movie. Oh, yeah, I love it. it it's, it's, it's probably, you know, something I turn on and, you know, it's, it's good sci-fi, you know, schlock. And, uh, um, there she goes, performed by the Boo Radleys, by the way. I had no idea who ever sang that song. But um, it, it is like the Cranberries' dream song, which I cannot stand to listen to because it was used probably the most in the 90s in any other song. That, that, <laughs> that was pretty close. The, this this song and, and the, the cranberry song were probably the, the trailer song of the nineties. I'd say it was it was dreams. There she goes, and the spin doctors, two princes, two princes. Yeah, or, or a little or a little miss can't be wrong. And the, the, uh, you see, <laughs> you see the spin doctors. And you hear those songs. And you can't stand here two uh, two princes once again. He just wanted to play Pocket Full of Krypton on the radio, but they won't, because oh I still really like that song, you know. Oh, I'm sorry. Jimmy, Ol- <laughs> J- Jimmy Olsen Blues is the song, not Pocket Full of Krypton. That's the name of the CD it came on, which I fucking owned, Ex- you know. Right. Oh, God. Jimmy Olsen Blues is the one good song off that album. It is, it is, it is a great song, man. Like, Jimmy Olsen can't get it. Let's write a song about it, you know. Oh, my God. Okay, so I want to talk about Harriet for a second here. Go for it, man. So Harriet has been married, what, twice before, three times before? Three times before. Okay. When she, when she, pull, when she pulls the rings out, out of the powder, you know, which, again, you're not, it's not revealed yet, but she has three rings on, on, the, on the chain, you know. Right. Okay. So she's got three rings for the dwarves and, what was it, eight rings for the <laughs> tribe of men. I don't remember how that works. But – my point is, if she knew that every other person that she had been married to had been mysteriously offed and left with a forged suicide note of some kind, why would she agree to Charlie? Doesn't that make her an accessory to murder? She at least knew she was putting him in danger. That's a very toxic flaw in a human being. Look, I love you. We should get married, even though I'm pretty sure that you will be murdered horribly on our wedding night. I would imagine that Rose hid the body, you know, from from her sister, because if she's leaving suicide notes and she's killing them with an axe, I'd imagine she's hiding the body somewhere and not telling, not not letting the sister see the body. So she she may think that these these men all rejected her, or they just went somewhere else or something, or they killed themselves, whatever whatever the note says, or if the notes are even all alike, you don't even know. It's just um, I'd imagine that's the rub. Like yeah, I guess they didn't love me enough. They're they're gone now. You know, kind of like um, oh what was it, the American Dad episode, where Stan uh. Besides, his mother can't have a boyfriend, so he keeps getting rid of all of them, you know? She has the brilliant uh, song with him about washing her in the bathtub, you know? Oh, my God. I've seen that episode more than twice. Okay. Yeah, you're right. You're right about that. That's funny. It's that's, not, it's not said, is. but I'd imagine that's what's going on because, you know, if her sister it's, was a murderer, potentially she, true. You know, she, she would know this probably. It just seems like a lot of work. That's all I'm saying. It just seems like that's a lot of physical labor to chop and hack these people into pieces and then take them away from wherever Harriet was and bury them in hefty bags underneath an oak tree in a public park. It's just it, – there's a lot of effort there. But you know, maybe I'm, I'm probably overthinking this. Maybe not, yeah, but they don't explain all that. And Oh, oh by the way, you were not wrong – in your assumption that there she goes is sang by two people in the two different groups in this movie because it was performed by the Boo Radleys and whatever the fucking laws are. I, again, I don't know who these bands are. I, I just heard this song. No, no, no. Yeah. The, laws, the laws were the ones who did it originally. So the okay. laws did it. The Boo Radleys did it. The Boo Radleys probably did it while sort of hiding in a closet in a child's bedroom. That's all I can figure. And then – Sixpence None the Richer did it later, but it didn't make it into this movie. Yeah. I remember that just being very drab, and I wanted to hang myself in the bathroom. Yeah. Oh, God. It's just with a, a terry cloth bathrobe belt, just 
over the spring rod and the shower, just just the six pence on the richer recording that song whilst cutting himself in the bathroom. God, just bury me in a bowl of granola and be done with it. Oh, I'm so tired. Anyway, I'm sorry. I'm going off. And hey, really, there's there's a there's a film to discuss here. Don't forget the Greek yogurt <laughs> with that granola. Okay, you got to have both things. Yeah, you know? that's right. You're you're absolutely right. <sighs> what kind of demonic resort was that that they stayed in, where they carry you to the honeymoon suite in a wicker chair? Maybe they what were kind sacrifice- of dirty dancing garbage. Is that? Maybe some weird Scottish Jewish tradition or Scottish pagan tradition to where they <laughs> lift them off in a wicker chair and then they throw them off whatever cliff and seaside area they're at and, you know, hope for crops, I guess. You know, I, I don't know. For crops. They pick a newlywed so every Eric year. Carmen and Christopher Lee should have been there. They, they pick a newlywed every year. They, they chose them, you know. <laughs> Throwing us off the hotel so going to bring your apples back. Hey, man, I, I'll say the greatest flaw of that movie. They, they should have fucked, and that would have been the end of the movie right there. You know, like, it's, it's a real mento situation. Oh, you're not wrong. I've, it, said, I've said that repeatedly. I really S- have. Sergeant Howard should just got it wet, y'all, and that would have been the end of the Wicker, wicker Man right there. Cause he's no I longer, mean, it's longer not like he didn't have the chance. She was right next door banging on the wall, like, come on, we can do this. Here's your out. And he's like, oh, no, can I get my, can I get my wick wet? Stupid. Yeah. He was. She was singing like Charlie was singing to her at the window. I'll say anything like, but she was. She was naked with her wonderful ass hanging out and her uh-huh. tits and just just making love to the wall or something. Yeah. <laughs> Mentos better. Mentos I'm, fresher. I'm sorry. What movie are we talking about? Oh, because I'm. Okay. I'm. Yeah. yeah you're Br- right, Brett right. Eklund's sweet ass uh, part two. I guess. Yeah. I don't, I don't the know. The only sweet ass we see in this movie is Mike Myers. Yeah. You see that? Yeah. <laughs> you know, for, for for a male butt, though, it's quite full. You know, so there's that, you know. And if you ever want it's to see toned. that. It's toned. It's, it's toned and firm. It's very toned and firm, yes. Um, <laughs> I just think it's funny where he's just like, I'm naked, aren't I? So good. It was like it was by accident or something, you know. It's like we kept that. <laughs> you know? <laughs> um, no, but I know, I, I know I'm bragging on it, but honestly, I don't hate this movie. I think it's sweet. I think there are a lot of things that are ridiculous such as oh i'm having a hard time at the butcher shop why don't you come behind the counter and start chopping meat no one would do that in real life but if they didn't then there wouldn't be that that connection that moment and we sort of need that silliness to happen and so so to me that's the thing this movie is based on a lot of silly situations and connections and then veers way off in the left field almost to have like blackout skits like why did they go to alcatraz to meet phil hartman there's no reason for that because it it's, san, it's san francisco and it's magical scene you know that uh but they live there why would they be doing touristy things i live near pigeon forge i don't go to dollywood it's ridiculous. You know? Oh, oh! Next time we're going to Dollywood, tell you right now, man. Me, me, I don't care. You know. Oh my God, so you're gonna, <laughs> you are going. You are going to hate it. Mm, well, we'll I, see. Uh... <laughs> uh, speaking of audio cues, though, with that butcher scene, which you know, he, he explains that his father was a butcher, so he has some experience behind the counter, which I'd imagine is the only reason why you would let him behind there and work with cleavers and you know. Cuts of meats that are probably fucking ruined otherwise. Um, yeah, so there's Look, that. Look, I've got some experience behind the counter, too. I ain't trying to go into a retail shop and insinuate myself. <laughs> You'll turn yourself into fucking um, Randy the Ram when he, he jams his thumb and then the, the slicer for, for no reason. Because some old bitch is <laughs> bitching about potato salad. You know, that's a... See, I've been to the grocery store for, I've worked there for a couple of weeks, and I thought often about jamming my thumb in a slicer, too, with some of these goddamn requests they make, too, so, that, uh, um, but the audio cue is, um, the song Rush, or Rush for a Change, is a song you heard in the 90s a lot by Big Audio Dynamite, and this is, um, again, the most 90s movie you could think of, because that's in there, too, so. Uh, that's true. You're, abs- you're absolutely right. And you were talking about the, um, final cover, oh, of... Shit, what was the damn song? It was There She Goes, wasn't it? That was done by Ned's Atomic Dustbin. Yeah. And you've really got to be like a 90s nerd to remember Ned's Atomic Dustbin at all. That, that, that and Dinosaur Jr. and, you know, bands like that, you know? 
right? No, oh, was, man, I love Dunn Jr. They did the cover of the the, the, the Bay City Rollers song that you, you get at the, yeah. in the in the credits, yes. And then for some reason, I don't know where there's like a toe of the wet sprocket there in the middle, just like, oh, my brother, I found you deep in my heart. It's like, put your shoes back on, Glenn Phillips. You are not welcome here. <laughs> Because it's the 90s. you got to have Toad the Woods Sprocket. got to have Toad. I, I, I'm looking for the Bodines on the soundtrack, but I can't find them, you know. They should have been there. The Bodines should have been there. Or somebody like that. Well, the Bodines will probably be at some festival this summer or somewhere you're going to go. I imagine they're, they're still together playing tunes. As are the Spin Doctors, surprisingly. The Bodines. So. <laughs> yeah, the Bodines, the Jayhawks, maybe. Um, the Rembrandts. The, the Hooters, uh, these, you know. Oh, I love the Hooters. I listened to their album like two weeks ago. It still holds up really well, despite the weird sort of I'm playing a recorder that has a keyboard on it for no reason. Mm-hmm. There's a name for that instrument. I don't know what it is. It doesn't, it doesn't matter. I'm so, God, we are, di- we're not just digressing. We are Delta-ing. We oh. are like, we were on the main river, and now all of a sudden, where where Victor where, where Victor Crowley lives. If, That's you, just crazy. If, you, if you don't know by now, we don't plateau. We just we just go up and down. This and this, and we we get together. So, if, if you don't like it, I yes. guess I guess just get used to it. I guess I, I don't know, and you know, just just go just go forward until I stop talking. I I think the, uh, I think uh, importantly to address, you know, all of Charlie's flaws are not really brought on by his mother. I mean, she's a very doting person and, and very horny, which is fucking hilarious. When she's uh, she's all in love with Tony, Anthony Lopaglia's character, to the point where she's grabbing on his ass and fucking really laying it in with that kiss. And, you know, because he's a sexy wee bastard. If you can't handle Brenda Fricker, he is. But if you can't handle Brenda Fricker at her horniest, then you don't get her at her Mike Leighty-est. Yeah, because she, the whole thing is, you'd think that she'd be like the catalyst for, for for Charlie's, you know, the way he is. You know, real mama's boy. You know, ma- mama always, you know, said he's the best thing ever, blah, 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 blah. He, he's not Latino, for Christ's sake, you know. And luckily for me, my mom's was a, a lot more nurturing. <laughs> well, well, all Latin moms are, because all Latin moms treat their sons like little Latin kings. And that's where we get that macho shit going to the max. <laughs> and my mother was no exception, because since I was a baby, my mother would be like, Ay, mijo, you are the center of the universe, papi. <laughs> You're all things to me. Uh-uh. Learn to share. <laughs> Remember me, huh? Remember any woman that fucks you will probably fuck somebody else, okay? <laughs> and you don't want to marry a whore. No, no, because, because no woman is good enough for my little Latin king. I love it. No offense to Latinos out there. The, but you, the afraid. I'm sorry. Right, well, but, you know, the afraid of commitment, the not wanting to get married, the whole thing. He's very shy. And you would think that that would be because of his mother, but they've been married for, what, 40 years, something like that? 30 years? Yes, yeah, it's, it's 30 years, they did, because they had the 30th anniversary in the, in the movie. So that's impressive to me, because it's, I guess there's not really any filmic explanation for why Charlie is so standoffish and afraid afraid to love he is afraid to love his boundaries remain high he is guarded and we don't know why to, to, to the, could it be to, to, to be to the point where you're beca- oh, sorry no it's just like could it be because in himself he believes that his head is gigantic that's his brother's head that's gigantic you know come on you know it's like Sputnik, for Christ's sake. Right. I was going to say, maybe Charlie's afraid to love because he's afraid that he makes a rancid stink in the bathroom. It's possible. I've taken some big shits before, dude, and I'm not going to lie to you. You know, my, my bowel movements are strong sometimes, but I never mm-hmm. thought about, uh, you know, w- w- commitments in that way. Where if, I'm sure if I lived with with somebody for, you know, 20-some years and... You actually cut one in the bedroom. Uh, I'm sure they might accept your gas, and they might tell you to get the fuck out. I don't, I don't, I don't know how you and Cootie work, man, but I imagine, you know. My entire thing is that about Brenda Fricker being horny. 
was that when you look at that bathroom scene where Mike Myers is washing his hands and he's flipping through the weekly world news, one of the books that you can see in the bathroom on the rack is called The Women's Room by Nancy Friday, which came out like in 1977, 78. But it was all about the sexual fantasies of American housewives. And it was huge at the time. It was controversial because nobody thought that women actually – had fantasies, especially American housewives, it's like your fantasy is about mopping, okay? You should be wanting to do starch on my collars, and that's it. So this book, being right there in the bathroom, it's not only necessary reading, but it's convenient reading, and that says a lot to me about Brenda Fricker's character in this film. She's pent up, boys. Uh, she, she wants to get it, man, but... um. The Stuart McKenzie can't, can't give it up because he's too busy screaming about sausage and stuff and his son's massive head. Sausage yeah. and, 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 and why doesn't he call it football? I mean, why doesn't he call it football? He calls it soccer, and that's weird to me. I guess that's the American influence because imagine, he should I, say I, there's a football game on and not a soccer game on. I, I'd imagine they've been in the country for quite a while, and you know they they've uh, adapted to to that kind of that kind of lingo in American society. Um, one of the things that one of the greatest things about this movie is the the conversation that Stewart has with, with with Tony on the couch about the pentaverit, and I'll tell you why. Because um, it, it's amazing, first of all, that the 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 C six major things run the entire country, including the newspapers. And one of the best things I have not watched yet, and I imagine it's 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 it's, it's insane. The connection to this movie is they made a, a six episode uh, series called the Pentaverit on Netflix that that has Mike Myers as this journalist who is investigating the the actual Pentaverit that is discussed in this film. So I, I'll have to, I'll have to go into this one day. You know? I have not seen that. That's hilarious. So they go that far to to to, to, to make this, and I I I really enjoy. Um, him playing his father in this movie when he's just screaming at the the brother or screaming at Charlie, you know, or uh, when he's fucking singing and dancing. And, of course, the classic when they're at the wedding and he's singing the Rod Stewart song. Well, the second Rod Stewart song of the movie he sings because when he's just dr he's drunk during the one and he's singing, do you think I'm sexy with a live bagpiper? And the piper falls over. Don't worry, he's just pissed. You know? He's just pissed. <laughs> And the best thing is, he sings the Rod Stewart songs with the incorrect lyrics. I take that back. It's the correct lyrics at the wrong time. And that's how you know he's just constantly drunk. And it cracks me up. That character is one of the best characters in the film. And again, I go back to my original point. Every other character in the movie is someone that I like better and identify more with than Charlie. Because they spend so much time getting like close-up, full-frame shots of Myers like smiling or laughing or going, hello, which... I swear to God, if I was in a relationship with somebody and they said that all the time, I'd be cracking skulls. I would be punching them in the jaw so it had to be wired shut and they could no longer make that noise. But everybody around Charlie, like his circle of friends and family, perfect. Absolutely love. Because he, he's kind of a douchebag. And uh, again, you don't know what he does for a job. He could just like, you know. Be, be living off the, the government tit or something. I, I, I don't know. <laughs> Gosh, he could be. I, Let me say this, though, about Harriet and her apartment. There are a lot of houseplants. She has an abundance of houseplants. She has a closet with a glass door. And on this railing, like, that divides the top floor from the bottom floor, there are feet. They're like mannequin feet. And I don't know how to feel about that. Like, I want to be impressed while at the same time, I'm sort of terrified. I'll say it again. It's 1993. You're living in this fucking new, new bohemian fucking art fetish bullshit to where somebody would put mannequin oh. feet on the bottom of a flower pot and say, call it art, you know? Well, I'm not aware of too many things. I know what I know, and I know there shouldn't be feet in your apartment, but that's that's just me, I guess. I knew you were going to do that. <laughs> I knew. <laughs> you set me up. You opened that door. I waltzed right through it as I should. Did you waltz right through the shallow water, though? Before I got too deep? Yeah. You better believe I did. Mm -hmm. 
You see, we did that. That's called uh, alliteration or something, people. You know, it's a beautiful thing. It's just, uh, man. Yeah, the, 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 I, I really dig it, though, I, for, for all these reasons mentioned and all of its flaws. And I think the flaws... You know, our, our Charlie, like I said, he's like the most not likable character in the film, but for, for for good reason. I think it's written that way. I, I think it's written brilliantly for you not to like this man. I, I mean, I think last uh, last year we did, and this is much worse than this movie in, in as far as the narrative goes and as far as the character goes. The only time I've ever hated Joseph Gordon-Levitt in anything was uh, not not because it wasn't a good performance, but as a character was 500 Days of Summer, which, you know, Summer lays out right away. Zoe Deschanel's character, that she's not looking for a relationship, but he's constantly looking for a relationship. Now, Harry in this movie is kind of doing the same thing. You know, she, she's she been hurt before by these three other people. She doesn't talk about it, so when he, he brings up the... He casually says the lines of, you're the best husband I ever had. She goes, oh, what do you mean by that? Like, he, he knows something, and she, she thinks that he knows something. But she's not sharing this information. Um... Whereas in the other movie, it's laid right out. Like, I, I don't want a relationship, I just want to fuck. And he's like, but I want a relationship. I told you, motherfucker, I just want to fuck. Uh, she's not really looking for that one. Is, that's fantastic. No, that's, that's fantastic. That is such a great um, comparison because, like you, I really hate Joseph Gordon-Levitt's character in that movie. He's a human fire blanket. He just smothers any spark that could possibly ever happened between the two of them by being awful. Yeah, that's mm, dead on. Well done. Yeah, I really dig it, though. I, I dig everything, and, you know, the, the Phil Hartman thing, it's a real small thing, but Phil Hartman had a real small thing in a lot of things, and it, it just makes you miss some more, him telling, just him being this Alcatraz guard telling this story about Machine Gun Kelly and them taking a bitch and cutting out his eyes and then pissing in the ocular cavities and then which is right to this way to the cafeteria, you know, it's, it's like, yeah, who wants to eat now after that? And, you know, but they're, 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 well, not Tony so much, but Charlie is, is kind of so into himself at this point, And she's so infatuated with Harriet that, that it's like, yeah, I'll, I'll go eat a hot sandwich after somebody talks about pissing in somebody's ocular cavities. You know, it's just a uh, sign me up, you know? See, and I think that that third act, and I've probably said this before, but that third act redeems everything else in the movie. Um, the chase across the rooftops where Charlie gets hit in the balls at least as many times as they play There She Goes in the movie. It's incredible. It's really funny, but it's tense, and it makes up for the multitude of um, – weird avenues that the script takes before we get to that point. It's almost like they wrote the movie backwards. Like we have this idea for a great ending. What kind of weird shit can we do to get to this point? And I sort of love that because I've been known to write stories backwards myself. So I can't be mad about that. And I think that the last 20, 25 minutes really bring the movie together and maybe not ties it exactly perfectly with a bow on top, but it's extremely satisfying and I, 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 I dig it. Well, you get resolution for Harriet who, who realizes what's, what's going on now. She realizes what's going on now with her sister and, well, why these? Why she wasn't the problem? Because like, the whole the whole film is about her being rejected and her being afraid of rejection. And Charlie, who's the exact opposite, is rejects everybody he sees. You know, up to the point where he 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 broke up with the girl for smelling like soup. This was his excuse. Yeah. <laughs> Doesn't even say what kind of soup. Like it could have been French onion. Maybe that's acceptable. But no, just soup in general. Just a chicken base. Just. This is a reason to break up with somebody for him, though, and that's that's exactly. really fucked up. But the, 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 them being paired together, and of course, in the end, you know, coming together it is having this this murderer catalyst as a as a as a linchpin to where okay, now I can trust her. But it's it's still in the in the back of his her her brain. Like this guy thought I was a fucking killer, but then again, he had every reason to think that way. And yeah, she she realized that now, and yeah, it's it's. It really comes back to the last 25 minutes to get all that, and, and you get Charles Grodin and Stephen Wright uh, as well in that last 25 minutes. 
So good. I, I, I had the strangest dream, man. I was born, and I was born eight months premature, where he says, you know. Stephen Wright. And just Charles Grodin waiting, like, I don't know, six, seven beats just to be like, no. <laughs> it's just <laughs> the best. His timing was so wonderful. What a great actor. Yeah, if you've ever seen Midnight Run, which is another film, I'm sure I, I will I will choose my brother to talk about because it's a very important one. Um, this and I, I think... Midnight, Midnight Run and Albert Brooks's real life. To yeah. me, that's the best Grodin movie is real life. Best Grodin. You know, I was introducing introduce Grodin. Um, fucking Beethoven was my first Grodin experience. So that just proves I'm a 90s kid that I, oh I, I saw Beethoven first. and It got better from there. No, I, I take that back because my sister had a VHS and she wore the shit out of the Incredible Shrinking Woman. But I didn't realize that was Grodin back in those days. So I guess my first Grodin when I realized he was Grodin was, uh, was that was Beethoven. Uh, okay. I like Incredible Shrinking Woman. It's very 80s, and that's that's perfectly fine. What did you think about Seems Like Old Times? I, I've never seen this before, so one of these days, it's, it's, on, the, it's, on, it's, on, it's on the shame list, you know. It's, it's, um, okay. Okay. But, um, I need to watch that again because I remember not liking it, but, you know. This is Chevy and, Go- this is Chevy and Goldie Hawn, right? Yeah, okay. yeah. But, you know, as you get older, you tend to appreciate things more like, I don't know, fine wine or tomatoes or Johnny Mathis. So maybe, maybe I could go back and look at that movie now and think, oh, well, there's Charles Grodin and everything is fine. We'll we'll just look for characters. I feel that way about... I'm sorry. Yeah, I feel that way about most natural disasters. Like, if just... If I can see terrible things happening and then just see like a still photograph of Charles Grodin, then everything is fine. And I can motivate myself from that to actually do positive things in a very slow and measured manner. It's like, wait, is Chuck Heston here? Uh, it, it's all better than, see, you know, it's a, uh, <laughs> it, 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 in a cinematic realm, not, not in the crazy Republican gun tote realm, but, you know. There was a there was a time there was a time, children, in the 1970s and probably somewhere in the 80s, that we believed that Chuck Heston could save the world. And um, yes, um, it was the Ascot and the rifle combination. Oh well, yeah, it works. It totally works. Yeah, you know? like Debbie, you get that you know Rudy. T- well, the, like the moon over my hammy. You get the scarf. You get the rifle. You get some hash browns. Charlton Heston can do anything. Oh man, what, what, what about some grits with that breakfast, man? Come on now, yeah, with that. Uh, don't even start me on restaurants that don't serve grits because they deserve to be burned to the ground. <laughs> oh, man. Any final thoughts about this movie you want to talk about while, while you keep on plateauing and going back down again? None, none, none of this is being edited out, by the way, people. I don't even give a fuck, but uh, here we are. Uh, shoot, brother, go ahead. So I Married an Axe Murderer doesn't particularly work on a rom-com level because it's romantic in a very I don't want to say deficient but a warped sort of way and the comedy is it branches out like the veins in your brain like you, you the spinal column comes up and that's solid and then it just shoots all over the place into weird sort of comedic sequences that have nothing to do with the rest of the film but if you can hang with it and get to that last 25, 30 minutes where they're, where they're on their honeymoon, I swear it all comes together and it all makes a sort of non-lucid sense. And it's totally worth watching just because of that. And it's a movie that I can see the flaws in but one that I absolutely love. And I don't know why I don't watch it because I should. And we all should because it's fantastic. Yeah, it's, 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 um, let's see how old I am now. This is 1993, 2003, 2023. Uh, this is only, this is almost 30 years old people. And, um, I'm old. So, so there you go. And, uh, I, I love it 30 years ago. I love it now. You know, for all of its flaws, for all of its, uh, you know, foibles or, or whatnot. Foibles is a good night to word, see? It just has a, uh, much like this film. It's foibles a, is great. Yes. It's a, it's a 90s, 90s uh, <laughs> word for, for a very 90s film. 
and I, I um. This is Aesop's foibles. This is, this is Aesop's foibles, yes, indeed. You know, he's going on a quest to go find the Nookie that he's always not really deserved, and that's Charlie's fatal flaw. Um, but is that he does it all for the Nookie? He does it all. Well, yeah. So you can get that cookie and sit up your yeah, <laughs> sit get up your yeah. yeah. See that that's the that's the, the chocolate starfish and the hot dog flavored water for you right there. Uh, and mm. you, you get all of that in, in this movie. Um, I think I try to give a corn reference, but I'm not going to go there. Um, it's 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 fun. If you've never seen it before, you can find it many many places: digital, DVD, Blu-ray, HBO Max. Currently, apparently, according to uh, IMDb here, um, go give it a watch. It's, it's I I think it's some of um, Mr. Meyer's finest work. Um, I choose this over Austin Powers most days. Although there are some jokes in Austin Powers that are. Make it a wonderful ensemble film. This is a wonderful ensemble film. If you ever want to watch Brenda Fricker, who most people would know as the Pigeon Lady from Home Alone 2, get all horny and stuff and be funny as hell, um, go, go check this out. Um, God, Brenda Fricker. She's in some shit that I love that's fucking real garbage. Like like Masterminds with, with Patrick Stewart and, and Angel Son from Angels in that movie. Um, That's a good movie. It's it's not it's not though, dude. It's just it's just toy soldiers with some with some tech in it. That's all it is. But um, <laughs> I, I I've, I've watched it this. again, just like this movie. I watched it no, at HBO many, many times. Charlie is a freak on a leash, but it really takes the thought of losing Harriet to make Rose bad. Yeah, all these things, you know. This was your fault for not corn rip. I'm just gonna be over here in the corner. That's fine. <laughs> see, you see, I did there. I took X, you know, one step closer to the edge, and then he broke. See, and now I we're cannot in, take this anymore. Now we're in Lincoln Park territory. See, <laughs> oh my God, I, I'm done. This, this is um, '90s and aughts just it's spilling all over this show, and I'm fine with that. But um, it's fine. It's fine. <laughs> it's become the hot tub, tub, hot tub time machine episode, and that's okay with me. We will do this again though very soon, sir. I, I miss I miss you and, you, and you know this, man. I miss you too. I've just been super busy. Hey, I have an idea. Let me tell you where you can find me if you are so inclined to do so. Golly, I'm the senior editor of Biff Bam Pop, and I write a weekly column about wrestling called Around the Loop, which you can read every Saturday. I write lots of books. I still write lots of books. You can find those on Amazon through St. Rooster. You can find them digitally through Godless. And guess what? I got stuff coming out this year that I can't talk about yet because it's super secret. It's like secret squirrel secret. But it's coming, and when it's ready, I will let you know. Hi, how are you? There she oh, goes. There, she, there go. she goes again. There she goes again. Yes. There he goes again. You know. Oh my gosh. But yeah, well, I, I am. I'm hoping that this past Valentine's Day, and you got your partner that cheap posy from from the drugstore, got you some nookie. You know, so you can get that cookie. And we're doing it again. But um, <laughs> that's the end of this. Do all those things that X told you to do, and and uh, yeah, we'll be right back with something else for you. Could I have your name, please? Hack, Marilyn Hack, stage 11. You were in that prison movie where you you punched that little girl in the face. No. Nope. Marilyn Hack made quite the splash for her portrayal of Imogene, the blind prostitute. And you know what they say about blind prostitutes? You really have to hand it to them. <laughs> we can cut that out. I don't know why I got that. I'm your agent. There is nothing more important to me in my life than, than you. Excuse me. Victor Allen Miller, the venerable Broadway veteran best known as Irv the Footlong Wiener, now starring in the Sunfish Classics feature, Home for Purim. Where the heck have you been? <laughs> oh, aren't you nice? Well, uh, actually, I've been teaching in... Uh... Well, that's a rhetorical question. And action. What kind of girl doesn't want to be the nice fella? I did meet a nice fella. Her name is Mary Pat. Or am I just going to sugar? Mama! And cut! I want you to add something from the bottom of your womanhood to make it a... Tone some of the themes down a little bit. How would that be? Just tone down the Jewishness so everyone could enjoy it. But no, oh, jeez. What does a producer do? Lots of paying for sometimes ridiculous things like... like snacks. 
apparently there's something on the internet. Somebody brought up the idea of there being a possibility for an Oscar. For home for poor? <laughs> the internet. That's the one with email, right? Yes. I think you're looking at an Academy Award nomination oh, also. <laughs> did, they, did he just say that I thought he said? What? Yes, Victor. Oscars. I smell Oscars. You see what a little buzz can do in this town? <laughs> <laughs> I predicted it. I said, this is the one. This is the vehicle. Morley, you told me not to do it. I hope you like it as much as we like doing it. Someone's killed their children and made them into cookies, and I want to go see that. Uh-huh. Follow me around the circle. You your mommy. Yeah. 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 And we saw You're Debbie. You're Brian. He's just close from the A-list. In every actor, there lives a tiger, a pig, an ass, and a nightingale. You never know which one's going to show up. Hello, folks. Welcome back to the show. Uh, I'm here with many, many guests, and I'm very excited to tell you who those guests are, because they'll be the guests you'll hear for both of these reviews. Uh, one of which is Mr. Cord Syabs. How you doing, sir? I am doing excellent, Gary, and I'm glad that we could finally get this to work out so where we can talk about the final Christopher Guest or the latest Christopher Guest film for your beef anniversary. Yeah. Did I say that right? Yeah, these last two, yeah, you said it right, for sure. Uh, eighth or ninth year, I forget which one it is. Whatever, man, I don't do these anniversaries very often, but, uh... With me, uh, he does lots of shows, but he's my partner, and we're gonna get this going back on again. Blood from the, from Blood from the Core, uh, your Legion Patreon show, Mister Derek Bourgeois. How you doing, sir? Gary, it's been a while, you know, and it's great to be here to talk about uh, not just one but two movies, and uh, one I liked better than the other. Fair Let's enough. Put it that way. Fair enough. And Suzanne, you heard from from MFW in this show. She's here as well. How you doing, girl? I'm doing great. I'm happy to be with my three favorite podcasters. Hi, guys. Hey, Suzanne. I'm telling Sweet, I'm... I made the cuss, the cut. I got the bronze. I got the bronze. <laughs> he said cusp. I'm telling the Lord, you know. Da, da, da. <laughs> I meant to say cut, but, you know, that Delta 8's a real bitch. Man. Yeah, I know. I'm telling Iris on Suzanne, too. She She's in sunny California right now hanging out and stuff, so she she's getting it in. It, well, that's it, why she's not my favorite podcaster right now. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> It's going to be okay. But um, the next one... I got the bronze. I got the bronze. <laughs> <laughs> the next one up in the, the beef anniversary, Christopher Guest oeuvre, if you will, is uh, for your consideration from 2006. Um, this has a lot of your usual cast of characters that are in these movies, including Captain O'Hara, Eugene Levy. I'm not going to go through the whole cast list because these are the ones that you've seen uh, I'll name some new faces, though. Rachel Harris shows up in this movie. Um, John Krakinski shows up in this movie. Sandra Oh shows up in this movie. Richard Kind, which I'm surprised took this long for him to show up in one of these movies. I, I've always liked that actor. Uh, Scott adds that you might know, may know him as um, Pete for, from... Um, was it Pete? I forget his name. From 30 Rock. Uh, could be wrong on that name, but he's also Baymax from Big Hero 6. So, love that shit, y'all. <laughs> hmm. Oh, yeah. Oh, Ricky Gervais shows up in this movie. Craig Bierko, great character actor, shows up in this movie. I love that guy because I could see him in something funny, and then I could watch Long Kiss Goodnight and watch him be this fucking bastard. It's just, it's amazing, you know, the, the versatile oh, yeah. actor yeah. that Craig Bierko can be. Um, basically, this one is a, a film uh, about making a film, and it's kind of like Guffman in a way, because they're making this prestige film. And there's a rumor that some of them may be up for awards, hence the title, For Your Consideration. I'm going to kick it to Derek first and ask him his thoughts on this film. Yeah. Uh, I The thing that kind of took me out of this movie is because I actually was a big fan of like a lot of his other movies before this one came out, was it's not a mockumentary at all. It's, it, it's pretty much just it's more in a film style. Which is kind of weird because it's trying to be a mockumentary at times, but it's not supposed to be because they don't really follow the people around and Cameron is actually film scenes, if that makes sense. But uh, it still has some funny moments within it, but uh, it just took me out of it. You know, it, it's pretty, it has some good moments within it. You know, some of the acting characters that we love in these movies are great, but overall, it just, it just felt weird that this 
you know, he, he took a step back from mockumentaries and made pretty much just like this pseudo about making a movie. But I, I can see probably the kind of message that this movie is trying to interpret with that in that sense, you know, and yeah. You know, it's just some weird things where, like, you know, I don't even give a shit about the Oscars really either. So it's like, I don't give a fuck if these people get nominated or not. <laughs> you know, but overall, it still has enjoyable moments. It's probably on my bottom of the Christopher Guest uh, pool of films, but uh, it still has some interesting moments to it. But yeah. Cool. Suzanne. You know, this one I don't enjoy as much. Because for me, I think this there there are mo- there are moments of this movie that I find uncomfortable. I don't usually when they do the after everybody is thriving, and then when they were doing the oh let's go take a look at the, those that weren't nominated, and I I, I feel Catherine O'Hara taking out twenty bottles of fucking vodka because I feel there are some parties that I have where I'm having a cocktail party for 87 people, and she's all without a bottle of bottles. I just, this one, I don't know. It just doesn't, it, it's, it's, he's going for that movie within a movie, and I think the only person I actually enjoy in this movie is Harry Shearer as, oh my God, is his name Victor? Von Miller or something like Yeah. And he just takes everything as tried. He just, he's a commercial actor and he gets this great role. And I, I just, I, I felt a truly bad for most of the actors in this movie, the way that they were portrayed. It was just, I found the movie to be incredibly uncomfortable. And me, I, once again, don't give a shit about the Oscars. I did watch them this year and I got to watch fucking Will Smith slap Chris Rock. So, you know, hey. There's something to be said for that, but I just, I I can honestly say I just don't enjoy this movie the way there are moments that are funny, there are moments that are, you know, there's a, there's a few glimpses of genius in this, but I just, I don't enjoy the movie. It's, it's, it's kind of mean spirited where everything else he's done has been, you know, kind of done tongue in cheek and lightheartedly. This one is not. And I have to, it, have to admit it, it bothers me a little bit. Yeah, it kind of bothers me too. I agree. That's what I mean. I mean. Like, you know, it's like the movie itself. It's like you're following these people, but everyone else is treating them like shit, especially at the very end of the movie where they do like the three months after thing. And it's like, what the fuck? So he went for an almost, almost Oscar to pimping the fucking hula weights, you know? Yeah. And it's, like I said, this one just seems to me just to be a little mean spirit. Yeah. Uh, Court? I always forget this movie even exists after I watch it. I just, I fucking can't even believe that it just, it, that just sketches out of my brain pretty much. Uh, mostly, I would have to agree with what Derek and Suzanne have said. The only thing that I would really add is it seems like right after A Mighty Wind he got a lot more money thrown at him and decided he was going to stop doing what he was doing. And perhaps all the stuff in the mighty wind was so upbeat. And for the most part, everybody ended on such a high note and a happy thing. And that show was just this big grandiose, almost like that toothpaste commercial that they were making fun of it with that. He mm-hmm. took the left turn that he did to do for your consideration because, because he was almost sick of making everything so sweet and saccharine from a mighty wind. And he just got mean spirited for a movie. And thankfully he came out of that. Yeah. Yeah, this is this is probably the most dank of of, uh, of all all the movies, and like 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 um, Derek said, it's not a mockumentary like the other ones. They really don't give you the time to to get to know these characters all that much. All, all you know is Catherine O'Hara's character in, in the film Marilyn is like Hack. Marilyn Hack is like this aged movie star who doesn't do a whole lot more than what she's doing now. Or this is like her big her latest biggest thing where she plays the aged mother who's dying. So that that real prestige role. Uh, Harry Shearer is is known for, to be like the was he like the hot dog king or something like that something something along those lines. Mister <laughs> Alan Miller. Yes, so he's known for this this commercial stuff, and so he's never even known to be this big actor. And these two uh, up and comers again, Parker Posey as, as Callie Webb, she 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 has the most to lose from this really, and she, she loses with the rest of them because the whole idea of them 
getting excited for this possible nomination because somebody mentioned it and then the news magazine started mentioning it, so they get more and more excited. So when it happens, they get up early at 5 a.m. and they don't get nominated. She's just, she's crestfallen the most, I think. Whereas Marilyn Hack falls into alcohol and apparently plastic surgery before that because that's one of the one of the bad things I don't like about this movie is seeing Catherine O'Hara in, in that light where she's all Botoxed up and, you know, whatever. She she looks like she's a mess, you know. Yeah. But that, that's more of a look thing than anything else. But there are some shining points to this movie. Um, Jennifer Coolidge and, and um, oh, 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 what's the guy's name? Ricky Gervais. No, no, yeah, well, he's great, too, but, yeah, the Ricky Gervais stuff, uh, him him having the idea that they change because nobody knows it's Jewish holidays, so they make it Thanksgiving. The whole pitch of that would be <laughs> a, a real a real thing in, in, like, a room full of creative people, and he really brought some to the table with that. Uh, Mary McCormick in the bootleg Pilgrim Woman trailer was, was hilarious. Um, <laughs> uh, she's an actress that I, I've always loved, but she never gets any recognition she was in this great show on usa that i cannot remember the name of oh i know i know the one i just can't think of the name of it yes yeah. you're right yeah, same <laughs> what silk stockings no it was she was a u.s marshal <clears throat> and they basically put people into it's, witness protection it's like covert affairs maybe no it, uh, i'm thinking God, of... i'm gonna find it so yeah. continue that's okay now ricky Gervais shows up in this and there, there's um there's some other fun stuff. Of course, Fred Willard hamming it up with with Jane Lynch on this like Entertainment Tonight show. Those are probably the some of the best bits of the movie is with those two, of course, because they're just in plain sight. Yeah. Okay. In plain sight. Yes. There we go. Because they're just sorry. Kind of... it was no, you're okay. Nuts. You're okay. They're just comedy people, and I enjoy their their shtick, especially when they're together. But uh, one of one of the biggest you know faults of this movie is there's 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 a lot of them is that you don't get a lot of Catherine O'Hara and Eugene Levy doing stuff together. They're, they're separate, and I think it hurts the film. Yeah. You know. Yeah. Uh, they are such a great comedy duo. All you have to do is put them in a room and film them, and you've got funny. Mm -hmm. That's it. Yeah. And, you know, the thing is, for me, the one thing that always holds a Christopher Guest movie together is Fred Willard. He's literally the gopher from Caddyshack. It brings everything together. It's just he's just a little thread through the middle that everybody pulls to. And he's great as the 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 morning show entertainment tonight host. But he just it, it seemed like he was it, it just it seemed like he was wasted there. I mean, him and Jane Lynch were hilarious together. They were the they were the best parts of the movie. No. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Well, we're, we're we're talking bad about this film, and not in the worst way, but this is this is the bottom of the barrel, probably for all of us. But um, I'm going to kick it back to court. And uh, anything else you'd like to say about this particular one before we move on to something else? And what does it give one to ten? The first time I watched for your consideration, I didn't even know it was a Christopher Guest film until it ended up on this list for the beef reversary stuff. I didn't realize it was a Christopher Guest film. <laughs> like I said, I watched it. I forgot about it checked it out again to be able to do the shows and it's just kind of there. It just kind of exists. It's a movie. It's nothing to get super upset about, but in the oeuvre of someone that has been so brilliant as what guest has been something to be this far down the line, uh, you know, or the, the level of uh, the hierarchy, you know, for it to be this just okay and mediocre is a really big disappointment. So it's just a five, really, out of ten. It's just, it's okay. It just exists. Mm -hmm. If you got the time that you want to waste to watch it, that's fine. But otherwise, there's not very much stuff to really sink your te teeth into and enjoy. And like Suzanne said, it's really fucking mean-spirited, and I have a really hard time getting over that. Yeah. And you're not wrong. This is this is the only one that really feels not like his, one of his films, but it has all the people in it. So it just... It just seems like it kind of lays there, and just you know, it's kind of it's kind of a waste in a way. And I hate to to, to call that you know, all these wonderful actors wasting your time. It just it just doesn't work. Even his fucking character in the movie is shitty. Yeah, <laughs> but he looks like a racerhead. I mean, I'm I'm sure that was completely done on purpose. Maybe he was trying to hide his appearance. But yeah, it just it it just doesn't it doesn't work. Yeah, Suzanne. 
No, honestly, I agree with the five. I mean, there are there are points here that are really funny, and my problem is the majority of it is not fun to watch. The only magic that truly happens is Fred Willard and Jane Lynch, but they do go about it in a mean-spirited way. Oh, you were nominated, so how, how do you feel today? I mean, that is just cool, and I found it incredibly difficult to watch the last 20 minutes of it and i i know he was probably making attempt an attempt to make fun of older hollywood actresses and over botoxing facelifting but i think that just made it worse i just i i like i said there are a few shoddy moments but i truly just don't enjoy this movie at all yeah i get it i get it totally um derek yeah, it's definitely a five. It's it's just mean spirited and kind of boring. <laughs> even like some of the comedy sets don't even hit sometimes with me. And you know, you know, I, I gotta agree. Like the the Fred Willard stuff is pretty great, but I agree that it's also kind of goes way over the top and mean spirit at the very end of the movie. You know, and I would say I like them in the movie. I, I actually did like that Eugene Levy actually played an asshole character for once in this movie because in the last few Christopher Guest movies, he usually gets <laughs> fucked. <laughs> you know? But, oh, God, that he was just such a terrible agent. Yeah, he was such a dick. I like yeah, it. Yeah, I know. Yeah. But I don't think he, but the thing is with Eugene Levy, and once again, he was so barely there, I barely have a chance to talk yeah. about him. Yeah, I, I like He was the, just kind of there. Yeah, and it's fucking, you know, I love the scene where he's like, he smells the bagel while he's eating it at the end. <laughs> he's like, he gives us look like, oh. <laughs> but anyways, yeah, I, I like Harry Scherer in the movie. He's pretty great. And uh, that's about it. Yeah, it's a five for me, too. I mean, like, like, like what they said, this is bottom of the barrel for, for, for many, many reasons. And I, I always commend folks for, for making a movie. But when you make a movie that you're you're seeing a whole other way when you try something different and it fails it just it just sits there and this film just sits there so unless you're a real completist of, of these movies I, I wouldn't recommend it so we did the top six this would, this would be on the bottom from guessing most people so ugh. yeah and I, I just wanted to add one thing before Go for it, we man. leave <laughs> this review is I the most fucked up the thing that made me more angry watching the movie is because of my old DVD actually stopped halfway through the movie. Mm-hmm. So I actually had to fucking oh, rent no. this. So I actually had to rent it on Amazon to finish watching the fucking movie. I'm so, so sorry. It happens. I it know. happens. That happened to me in Black Belly of the Tarantula. I'll admit, though, the actually the Amazon, I should have just rented it to begin with because the DVD kind of looks like shit. <laughs> oh my gosh. Well, uh, that's it for this one. Next thing you should hear in the in the show of this beef anniversary episode would be myself and Mickey Morgan with Crippled Theater with 1986's Wired to Kill. Talk to you guys in a minute. Mascotting is not unlike a marriage in that it's about cooperation. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's about listening. Yeah. Um, it, it, even if people are screaming at you, you're not allowed to talk. And it, that's a good <laughs> lesson for a marriage. Yeah. You know? Hundreds of mascots wanted to compete in this year's competition. We finally narrowed it down to 20 finalists. Danny the donkey, my mascot, was the first one to have an anatomically correct costume. You know, I was overcompensating. Classic overcompensation. I'm Alvin the Armadillo. I love all kinds of dancing. I can, I can hip-hop. I can pop. I went to the Fluffies five years ago. I got honorable mention. That's like first place, really, but it's it's a weird first place. My name is Tommy, also known as The Fist. A lot of people say I'm the bad boy of sports mascotry. Hey, stop humping my wife! To be fair, I am currently serving six temporary suspensions. I announced the gold category. I wrote a book and I got more applause than you did. Did they make you this size just to fit in the worm costume? No, they... Made me this size when I was born. Was oh, yeah, I see. I thought maybe they shrunk you down or something. No, it's not like that. Just no. tell me everything. This fascinates the hell out of me. She's a pencil. Emotions. That came so close to 
Oh, oh Benny, the banana slug failed his drug test. What? Have you been drinking today? Yes. No, yes. Laughing. We have a drug problem and we got a sex problem. Hey, get back Mascots, they don't die. They just hang in a closet. Yeah, because they're it's, it's an outfit. It is, it's an outfit. I'm crazy about you. That's really sweet. I'll take that over some guy, you know, defecating on my head. Hmm. spirits that tend on mortal thoughts. The future past. A new dark age. A barbaric time after the Great Plague. A new American reality in a desolate land. To this imperfect world came evil, wearing a human face, came courage, forging an unlikely hero, and came destiny, resolute in innocence. I saw some guy out there. Well, he's just sitting out there waiting. Waiting! Fine. In the face of oppression, they became inventive, methodical, cunning, lethal, wired to kill. Now was a time of anarchy. No creed of honor. The only art is the art of survival. survival they found the ultimate truth if you want history you gotta make your own frankie schaefer's film wired to kill hello folks once again this is part of the beefversary this is crippled theater i enjoy once again by the guy you know from the helming power hour and so many other projects uh hopefully um coming back soon again I would love it, man. Ricky Morgan is here. How you doing, sir? Yep, yep. Oh man, it's always a blast to be back on here with my good friend Gary. So, uh, uh, you know, it don't really matter what the subject matter is. It's just going to be fun. Yeah, this is this is fun in a way, and we'll, we'll get into it. You know, it, <laughs> it, it, it's it's stra- it's a strange flick. Um, this time, Robert we'll Cripple Theater, uh, I chose. Ricky didn't choose this. Uh, I, I took a chance on a film I never heard of before, and, and sometimes it it works out and. <laughs> Like I listened to a podcast about Stone Cold today, the one, the one with Brian Bosworth. And oh yeah, the We Hate Movies episode. They never seen it before, and it was like a fucking revelation to them. <laughs> and I was like, as well it should be. There's a helicopter flying out of a window, I mean, a, a motorcycle flying out of a window into a helicopter in that movie, and it is one of the most irresponsible and amazing stunts I've ever seen in my life. And you know, oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> bad oh bad. We're doing Wired to Kill, though. This is also known as Booby Trap uh, from 1986. Because um, that, that fits the movie more than anything else. It, you and know bo- what? I, I think that works better, too. Yeah, if you, if you think about it. Um, this is written and directed by a guy named Francis Schaefer, who made, who made like three other films, and one of which sounds pretty spectacular. I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to look for it, because um, let, me, let me click on it right now and tell you what it is uh, before we get into this movie. <laughs> Oh, not that one. Uh, known for. Where's the directing stuff? Blah, 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 blah. Oh, here's the one. The Headhunter is a film where the plot synopsis a Miami cop finds out his wife has a female lover. He begins to have an affair with his, his female partner. Meanwhile, a voodoo demon from Africa arrives uh, among Miami's Nigerian community and begins decapitating some people and possessing others, including the cop's wife. I've, I've seen this one. Oh, really? <laughs> Really? Yeah. I had no idea it was the same director. <laughs> same director. Uh, uh, t- title card says Black Magic, Pure Terror. 
<laughs> it's just, it like 91, something like that when that came out? 88, uh, it says here. Okay. Yeah. Probably filmed 85. Where the fuck those? I, I, I want to see it, though. <laughs> I just kind of do. <laughs> um, yeah, that's about it that they, they kind of made. Um, but this one, your plot synopsis is, in the near future, law and order breaks down, diseases, violence, and immortality are rampant. However, one Christian, why well, I say Christian, young man decides not to turn the other, the other cheek anymore. He modifies his wheelchair, untrue, to help him protect his home and family and kill the thugs first. See, that's what gets you excited about this movie, but not a lot of that happens in this movie. You know. No, that's way more description than I ever get through the entire film. So <laughs> He does nothing to his wheelchair. So I'll give you the, 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 my, my plot synopsis of this movie. Basically, a plague has wiped out a bunch of people, and these two teens who are living together with the mother and the grandmother, um, one's, I guess, an aspiring robotics person and musician, the other one's sure. just kind of like a homeless drifter. I, I don't know what these, these kids got going on. It's very strange. But anyway. This I kept is trying br- to figure out, were, were they were they boyfriend, girlfriend? Were they cousins? What was the deal I, I here? I think cause... they were just friends, I think. I, I, think, <laughs> I think, yeah. It's really mm. strange. But um, it, it basically, this is the, this is a plague happens, kills a bunch of people, and it brings about uh, gang activity. So you, you're, you're looking at like Mad Max in suburbia. Which you're either in for that or you're not in for that. And I'll say this right now about this movie. I've seen films go this way in this kind of, you know, stuff. I'm talking to like Prayer of the Roller Boys, stuff like that, that that are worse than this movie. Because it, it, gets, it gets bonkers in parts. I'll, um, I'll kick it to the cast. Uh, Emily Longstreth as Rebecca, who's our, our female lead. She, she was in stuff like Pretty in Pink. She, she's all over the 80s. She she was a girl on roller skates and hard bodies, y'all. Come on now. I did, uh, yeah. Um, De- Devin Helsher. I don't. I he's not in much. But he plays our our um our our male lead, Steve. Uh, Mara Butrick, who you will know from stuff, plays Regus, who's the, our gang leader with the sunglasses <laughs> on. He plays Captain Kirk's son in uh, Star Trek Two and Three. <clears throat> um, he's in Fright Night Part Two as Charlie Brewster's buddy, yeah. and uh, most importantly, to '80s nerds like myself and Ricky here. He played Johnny Slash on Square Pegs. Yep. <laughs> so, yeah. But he was on. He was in Zapped as well. He's he's in a whole bunch of stuff and um, yeah, stuff worth your time, I think. Especially Friday Night Part Two, I, I think. Yeah. Oh yeah. Uh, so here, oh, here's sorry, my take on you given your synopsis. Mm-hmm. Here's my short synopsis of it. Uh, I, I, I described this to Danny, you know, the other guy from Hail Ming earlier about this movie is basically RoboCop, but you take RoboCop out of it because <laughs> all the bad guys are basically the same bad guys. It's almost like in Spaceballs when they capture the stunt doubles. Yeah. That's kind of what you got here. This gang is the stunt doubles to everybody who's in it, RoboCop. It, it even ends at sort of a foundry. They're, they're, they're like a junkyard at the end of this movie. And yeah. Where, I mean, where they even hang the out. place – where they hang out looks just like where Clarence Boddicker and the bunch was. So mm-hmm. yeah, that's kind of my takeaway of it. So and and it gave us the near distant future of 1998. Man, which for a second, I, here's here's my honest opinion. I, this is the 1998 that I wished for. Besides the one we got, where <laughs> the band Sugar Ray is around. Man, so, that's the one I was hoping for that was in this movie. So, but, but they just want to fly, dude. Come on now, yeah, yeah. they do. <laughs> Uh, this film features a young tiny Zeus Lister as Sleet, uh, like like Regis is number two. Um, it has a guy called um, Sly, who's played by a character actor that you've seen in everything called named Frank Collinson. This is the guy that rides the motorcycles, got the big teeth hanging out to Ricky. Oh yeah, he's been in lots of stuff. And if you, if you see the guy's <laughs> yeah. face, you'll you'll say, "Hey, yeah, I've seen that guy." Oh, uh, you know where you've seen him from? If you if you've seen Oh Brother Where Art Thou, he plays John Turturro's. Uh, um, Brother or, or cousin, cousin, cousin Wash, you know the one that that turns him in at the very beginning. Right, that's that guy plays, but he's in a whole bunch of stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, Kim Milford um, is a name you might not know. If you've seen Laser Blast, he plays the bully turned superhero. I mean, the the bully turned superhero in that movie. He plays a character called that. Rooster in this movie, and uh, <laughs> I, I I love I love Laser Blast. It's got everything you want in the movie. It's got you know. Gnarly look at aliens who are stop motion. It, this kid looks like a Frankenstein because he gets a, a a laser alien laser device attached to his arm. And oh, yeah. <laughs> you got you got um 
Oh, what's his face? Eddie Deason is a bully in that movie. You never get that ever in any movie. Um, right. <laughs> let's talk about this, man. Because the, the, the whole the whole synopsis is bullshit. Because b- basically, these people, this gang, invades their home um, for no for no reason whatsoever. Um, yeah, you know, yeah, b- 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 busts up the women, uh, breaks his breaks our our, our male leads both his legs. He's forced to be in a wheelchair. Doesn't sue about the wheelchair, but the whole crux of this film is he's all into he's all into robotics. See, he builds us this robot that's like really, yeah. It's like the fallout of teenage films because he he yeah. builds stuff from spare parts. But the 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 problem with this movie is they go for the whole post apocalyptic angle, but the neighborhood just looks like a shadier neighborhood than the one I live in now. Yeah. I mean, it, it it looks like just the outskirts of suburbia, you know, just it's like, why would they pick this house, you know, to, to raid? I mean, are they just that bored? So <laughs> I mean, they, they, they bust in the windows. And that's one thing, the real strong point about this movie is that the gang is, is pretty cool in, in their actions. But, you know, because Mary Buttrick is, is is the reason to watch this movie because he's just he's he's chewing the scenery. He's, he, his acting is not great. But his bad acting is, is keeping you in it. And, Let's um, just say that uh, Zeus came a long way too, man. Cause... Zeus, <laughs> Zeus came a long way, you know. With his um, oh, I, I have to get into this because the whole reason why this gang is after them further is because they do the stupid thing, like they got this bloodthirsty gang of dope fiends and dope sellers. Let's go file a police report against them. And <laughs> their whole idea is they're they're gonna hold their house hostage and them hostage and you know wait for them to to, to break this police report and hilarity ensues. The unintentional stuff you shouldn't be laughing at. <laughs> there is a part in this movie, Ricky, you know what I'm talking about, where the old lady is is walking I fear she's walking down the street. <laughs> yeah, she's walking down the street, the grandma, by herself in this supposedly terrible neighborhood. And then our homeboy on the motorcycle, the guy with the teeth I mentioned, you know, uh, Sly, just maces her in the back of the head. <laughs> now, I, I laughed out loud. Yeah, I shouldn't have laughed out loud. Only you could just slam in the back of the head. But it was just so freaking yeah. random, just it's like random. everything in this movie. Yeah. Yeah, and and the fact of you have to show him, like, licking the blood off the mace after he does it. Yeah! Like, really? <laughs> So random. I'm, I'm, go ahead. I'm, I'm blowing up the speaker here. Go, t- t- tell us what you think about the movie. Yeah. <laughs> I, you know, uh, it wasn't my favorite of, of the three that we've done for this. Uh, it's been my least favorite. It's got a few moments in it. Um, the robot that he builds is basically like a reconnaissance, you know, robot they're going to use to remove a bomb or something. I mean, it looks just like something like that. It's just four wheels and an arm that sticks out with a camera on it. And you kind of get bored with that part because they try to use it way more than it's useful for. And, uh, you know, it, it seems like they should have come up with some more creative ways, which is which would have leaned more to the booby trap idea. Um, there's one scene that I'm sure that you'll bring up, too, which had to do with the motorcycle seat, how they pay back the dude for killing grandma. <laughs> but, uh, you know, it, it's got some some pretty fun moments. It's worth watching if you like this time period of films but again like i said it is basically the setting of robocop with the same bad guys same kind of tyranny going on you just don't have robocop you got a dude with robotic legs for some reason when they break his legs they give him like robotic legs instead of you know just a cast and uh you know he programs robots and he plays music that sounds like the intro to every oingo boingo song yeah, this is brought to you by the Radio Shack Casio Keyboard Company, the, the soundtrack. Well, his <laughs> his soundtrack, because I think the actual soundtrack, you know, besides the, the out-of-place saxophone beginning of this movie, right? I think the electronic soundtrack is, is not that bad for a film like this. It, it's kind of like better, you know, than, it, better than it deserves, actually. Yeah. Well, like I said, it, it's it, when it kicks in, it's all the, it's all the, the you know, syncopated you know, keyboard riffs and that kind of stuff. So it's all, like I said, it sounds like the beginning of, you know, half your Oingo Boingo songs oh, you yeah. know, towards the end of the career there. And, uh, which is fine. I love Oingo Boingo, but that's just what it reminds me of every time. I expect to hear, you know, Danny Elfman start, you know, <laughs> start ripping some lyrics in there. Yeah. I think the biggest disappointment about this movie is, is that you expect it to go some places. Yeah. I mean, you got this Steve kid who's apparently an expert on building stuff out of nothing. He finds, he finds junk and he makes his, his computer system so he can make his music. He finds junk to build this robot. 
you you think that when they had like that flatbed that flatbed truck, you think that he would have had like an eighteen moment just built some shit for right. for like the destruction of these people that are terrorizing them and yeah. And then it could have went another way because there's a point in the house where his legs are broken, you know, grandma's head got bashed in, Ma- mom got kidnapped going to look for grandma, and her- she gets her-, her-, her back broken by these people. And then, <laughs> they just course, chase her in the car. I mean, it's uh, like, you know, th- we've got nothing else to do. Let's just, you know, chase her around and run her into something and smash her real flat, you know. <laughs> It's like she, she crawls out of the wreckage too. Like, yeah, there's no way she should have lived through this. But you know, she's like, "Yep, I'm gonna live, so you can never ever see me ever again, except crawling out of this heap of rubble." You know, saying, "I'm all right. I'm, I'm, I'm still good. I'm still good." You know, um, but he has this point in the, in the, in the script where he's, he's talking to to you know Re- Rebecca. He's like, she's like, we got, we got to like leave, we got to get out of here. He's like, no, this is my home. I'm staying here. Now you think you would have had like some gumption to like build some home alone traps or like uh, right anything because he can build a lot of things. He's a, he's a he's a extro- electronics expert apparently. Yeah, full the, Wes Craven mode, right? Yeah, this kid this kid could have built some electronic shit for these windows. He could have built some some filthy fucking. Death Wish three traps in this house for these bad guys as they come in, you know. Yep. I mean, it, it, let's sleep get a fucking spike to the balls. Why, why not, huh? It, 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 yeah. it, it, it'll happen. But no, they they they, just, they they leave they leave that plot. They leave so much just laying on the floor in this movie. Yeah. You you want it to happen so so bad, but it, it just it doesn't go there. And I think that's the problem with it. Now, <laughs> probably when this came out, that whole concept was probably newer than it is now, which which we grew up with. Home Alone and all this stuff. So that's where your mind instantly goes of you've got all this ability, like you said. Why are you not building this stuff? But no, we're just going to depend on, you know, my remote control robot. But they had the truck outside dude, with nobody in it. They're, they're, yeah. They're, you know, come on. Well, and then, you know, they finally do decide, hey, let's – this truck that we've got from them, let's put a bomb in it. And we're going to conveniently drive up to where they ha- hide out and and conveniently catch them all together in the same building at the same time. Uh, that scene cracks me up when they run the truck into there and it blows up. Oh yeah, because <laughs> because they're all inside. Looks like this kind of water tower looking thing. It's like how do they even see the truck coming? How do they know that there's something wrong with the truck? Because it's just a truck heading their way. <laughs> but they're all responding like, no, and it ain't got there yet. So how do they even know it's a bomb or anything? So that's just one of those things. I was kind of like. Yeah, they're screaming and they don't know why. <laughs> That's the only reason why you know they they should be murdered because uh, they've been inept this whole time. Their their whole his whole plan is reconnaissance with this robot. I mean, right. they're putting trackers on the trucks. You know, <laughs> there's the whole no tension seat or she drops the batteries out of the remote and yeah yeah and uh, of course she gets kidnapped by by uh, good old Regis there and. <laughs> It's forced to read Shakespeare for no reason at all. I guess to put on a show for the men. <laughs> I guess. You had a bunch of bums sitting there, you know, just clapping and stuff. I'm like, where did these people come from? He, he sleep told them to get their, their dirty asses down there. You know, Regus is going to put on a show. You, you better listen to good old Sleet there and it, uh, do, do, do what you got to do. Um, How about the uh, total recall moment with the... When the girl gets kidnapped by the cheap Ruger Hauer guy, and he tries to rape her, and he pushes the button for – she said she wants some music played, and he pushes the button, and then, like his eyes pop out of his head just like oh, you know, the Arnold scene. Well, one, one, of the, one of the great parts of this movie because it's a special effect that should not be in this movie, but it's there. You know? It's there. It's, it's awesome. You know? I mean this dude is a terrible person, and he's going to give her a request because you know, in order to be – you know, savaged, you know, she's, you know, hey, can you at least play me some music? <laughs> you know? Oh, oh man. Yeah, and, and, you know, they're, they're, they're constantly, he's constantly making upgrades to this robot because I, I forget where they get money from, but they get a bunch of money from somewhere. Oh, they, they steal it from, from, from Regus's crew and they buy, yeah. they buy a bunch of guns and bullets that don't go anywhere because they say, hey, let's make another attachment for this robot to where you can hold a pistol. <laughs> they, they they don't explain like, why. I'm oh, sorry. Go ahead. What? Yeah. Why, why would you make a, an attachment to hold a pistol? Why don't you make a gun that actually is part of the robot? You yeah. know, instead of it going going around and holding a pistol like it's in its hand. You know. <laughs> it just it's, it's all it's all 
it's all reliant on this fucking worthless robot that gets that gets blown up real good by sleet because yeah. it's basically a little bit of metal and some plastic. You know, that's all it is, and yeah. he gets real excited when it happens too. You know. Like, I got, I got it. Yeah. What it says again. Everybody's like, what the hell is it? Or something like that. And, you know, they had no idea yeah. what it was. And, uh. That's what's funny, too, is because everybody reacts to this thing when they see it, like when it sneaks up on it. Because you get the, the POV shot from yep. the camera that's on the robot, and they're like, ah! Oh! And all I can think is in Kentucky Fried Movie when the gas is, a toy robot! And he jumps out the window. It's the same thing. It's like, can't you just kick that thing over? Yeah! <laughs> You know? It has like it. It looks like you know if you were to cut up a an aluminum can and make wheels out of something, <laughs> except it's like plastic. You can crush this thing with your foot, and then it yeah. won't move no more. But you get all these baddies going. Oh, oh <laughs> Sly! The guy gets blown up on the motorcycle. He he, he has oh, that. He, that was pretty good. Now it, it was pretty good. Was pretty good. But he has a great moment in the hospital where he sees the robot, <laughs> and then the robot grabs him by his dick, and you know. It's, it's, uh, Which has already been damaged. It's so. already been damaged, so you know it's just it's crushing his penis with his small little, because his arm isn't very big to begin with. As it is, I'm not sure if he can grab a man's penis, but y- y- you will believe that this robot can grab this guy's penis because it just. <laughs> you will believe a robot can grab a man's penis. That should have been the tagline <laughs> yeah. of this movie. <laughs> <laughs> Make it real Superman esque, you know. <laughs> you will believe the robot can grab this guy's penis. Hilarious, hilarious. That's for Mrs. Lou. <laughs> Hilariously, mm-hmm. it will. Yeah, see, I think what this is going for it is is the soundtrack, and you know how how cool a few of the bad guys are because they really they really bring it down. You know, when you get these two milk toast leads who should be doing a lot more, you could blame it on the the script. You could they blame it all on the script because I, or the budget even I, I don't even know, but they they could have been doing a lot more with this. This kid who was an expert at building things. Yeah, you know, let, let him build some more shit. You know, go go totally eighties. Go go totally off the wall. Right. Yeah. I mean, it, it's this is the eighties. This is the age of the ma- montage, right? I mean, you know, you've got the music to do it. Why not have him build a bunch of stuff? How about the crazy scene <laughs> when the girl calls home to her dad's like, "Dad, I want to come home." He's like, nah, it's, it's nothing. "I don't think you need to." <laughs> it's nothing because he this whole explanation of why she ran away from home. Is that she couldn't get along with the stepmother, so she had the, the, the whole scene in the movie, you know, where they could have been had a scene of him building some shit. Uh, her, her saying, "Stepdad, I want to come home. Things are getting real bad here, or something." You know, she doesn't explain anything. She just says, "Well, you know, you, you, it just, it's not you guys are incompatible or something." He says, and yeah, you know, her and her and the stepmother do not get along apparently. Yeah, and that is a plot point of this movie for no reason whatsoever. Yeah. It's pretty weak. <laughs> you had to give a reason why she was living with Steve. Come right. on now, you know. <laughs> oh my gosh! But yeah, the ending. The ending is 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 what it is. You know, they 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 <sighs> soup up the truck sort of to make it explode and into their 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 area. You know, once once Rebecca is safe, of course, because she's kidnapped by by Regis by now and forced to read Shakespeare <laughs> and. Of course, Regis survives the explosion. He comes back to her for another. Oh yeah, yeah. And I, I, I forget how he dies. He does die though. You know. Uh, you forgot how he dies. Yeah, I forgot how he dies. This That's is the biggest all oh, come on moment in the movie. Right? Go for it, man. This is where you do have a different kind of booby yeah. trap because there's a gun laying there on the side, a pistol, and it's got a, a barrel or a, or a scope on it. And when he busts into their house, he grabs the gun and goes to shoot him. And when he does, it shoots back and shoots him in the face. Oh, they pull the surviving the game bit. Do you right. always Which, check the barrel thing? You know, well, they, they actually <laughs> he actually rigged the gun to where the shotgun shell they put inside the, the scope oh. that's pointing back to the guy. So when he pulls the trigger, instead of shooting forward, it shoots back at him with a shotgun blast. Let's explain where he is in this situation. <laughs> He is at point blank range to kill right. these people. Why would you need a scope on a shotgun? It's... Come on, Regus, you're better than that, you know. Yeah. I mean, uh, what's the chance? I'm I'm just sitting here thinking. They spent all that time. He, he spent all this time working on this one gun, hoping that when the bad guy shows up, he doesn't bring his own gun and he'll use this specific gun that's sitting here. You know. <laughs> That's that's a lot a, of assumptions a, there, Rick. You know, there's and, a, yeah, there's a lot of uh, engineering that went into that hypothesis of it working. So, 
<laughs> now, Rebecca, she should have been raped nine ways a Sunday by Regis's men, but it, it doesn't happen. Because... It doesn't happen, and they have her like four or five times. Yeah. And and she screams a lot, and they grope her maybe a little bit. They grope her – well, they, she gets groped less than uh, – than the girls that were at the 99 Woodstock that got passed over the crowds during, you know, crowd yep. surf stuff. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. This, this is, you know, I, 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 there's so many films that are like this, like this. They're trying to be, you know, post-apocalyptic. You know, mm-hmm. this, uh, Prayer of the Roller Boys I mentioned, which yeah. features another blonde actor who looks kind of like Bear Butt Rick, but not really. Um, class in 1999, but that works as Robot Teachers. Yeah, there, there's so many films like this that, that work so much better because they know what kind of film they are. Th- this film, right. this film struggles in that way to not know what kind of film it is. Yeah, in in, in certain points because you you're waiting. But like you said, there's not a lot of there's not a lot of movies that they say, okay, this kid's smart, he's gonna build some shit. You know, you had this movie, you had you know the the the, the final act of Nightmare on Elm Street where she's setting she's setting mm-hmm. booby traps and right but this this film has so many plot twists to say okay is he going to fight him in the house no he's not going to fight him in the house is he going to do this yes he's going to go fight him there but how's he going to do it with this stupid 5 pound robot <laughs> it, it, and it, it could have been so much better and that's the biggest part about this movie that, that I don't like yeah i mean seriously one one good you know leg sweep would have took this thing out and not even hard it could have been you know dude's grandma that kicked it and it would have been done you know so yeah if we put a whole bunch into this robot that really isn't that awesome when you see it so. deleted scene grandma walks by the robot and breaks its leg <laughs> sorry sorry stevie i broke your robot again you know oh man oh yeah i think it's worth your time it's on youtube yep. it's it's like an hour and 26 minutes it's a VHS rip, unfortunately, but it's really cool to see that lightning video uh, insignia pop up. Yep. Um, and I'll tell you, man, when when the when the logo of the of the movie come up and it said "Wire to Kill," I'm like, you know, this logo would be one of those things that if I was, you know, back in the day, I'd want to watch this just because of the way that looked. And uh, much to my disappointment of a lot of VHSs I rented back in the day, <laughs> this one would fit right into that bunch of. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but I'll still watch it three or four times, right? Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll sit there like if it shows up on cable or something, or like a USA up all night, which it may have very well have been on one of those oh, yeah. things. I think so. Um, what I love is all the comments on YouTube underneath this movie, and how many people are saying this is my favorite movie of all time. I'm like, mm-hmm. really? <laughs> and I learned a long time ago from a good friend that. You don't want to diss a movie too much because every movie is somebody's favorite movie. Mm-hmm. He made a, a very valid point. But when you say this one is your favorite movie of all time, there's a problem there. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I, I think it's like poised for like a Vinegar Syndrome release, you know, for, for all the actors that are in it. And, and, you know, the, yeah. the, the place that does go, I've seen a lot worse releases from them. And if, if anybody ever picked this up, I, I, I wouldn't say that I'd buy it. Maybe if it was like on sale or something, I'd buy it, but not not like full price, like go nuts like I did when uh, the Cloak and Dagger Blu-ray came out. Like I gotta, have, I, gotta I gotta have it today, you know. That makes sense. <laughs> <laughs> but um, this is this is good enough. I, I like I said, I've seen worse films like this. Oh sure, yeah. But um, I'm gonna I'm gonna kick it to Rick and ask him what he um, what do you give it out of, out of ten, sir? Out of ten, uh, I'll give it a six. Yeah, it's there. It's slightly over the middle of the road for me too. I, I'll give it that six as well. Yeah. Um, and it, it, like you, it, it had, it had some disappointment in it because there was a lot of potential there. It just didn't quite deliver on it. And it, but it wasn't bad crazy enough for me to give it even higher score. It was just kind of, yeah, you know, yeah, it's, it's just, yeah. It, it is what it is. Um, that's wired to kill though. It's, it's available for, for your <laughs> consumption on YouTube. Uh, if you, if you look at the, the IMDB, there's some, some tasty, uh, behind the scenes photos for no good reason of this movie. And, uh, <laughs> the kid working on the robot and, uh, married Buttrick just, just sporting those suspenders. Oh my gosh. It's so good. It's so good for those reasons. But yeah, it, the, 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 the holes in the script. Yeah. It, it, it needed, yeah. it needed more. Yeah. But, um. I'll I'll leave it uh I'll leave it that I'll leave it the chance if you will. Thank you very much, Ricky, for enduring this uh this picture with, with me. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> and uh we'll be right back with more CRISPR guest fun. Hello? Hello, who is this? Who are you trying to reach? I don't know. Um, I think you've got the wrong number. 
I'm gonna hang up. Wait, don't hang up. What's that noise? Popcorn? You're making popcorn. Uh huh. I only eat popcorn when I listen to podcasts. I'm about to listen to a podcast. Oh, really? Which one? Probably the podcast on Haunted Hill. Is that the one with the two guys with the beards? Uh, yeah, Dan and Gav. Dan and Gav, yeah. That podcast was scary. I liked it. Most episodes, they look at two different horror movies. Each episode, they look at a world of a strange, where they look at weird things from around the world. Sometimes, they even do special episodes where they look at different genres or directors' discographies and talk about them. Do you have a boyfriend? Maybe. So where can I find the podcast on Haunted Hill? Well, you can go to legionpodcast.com, Facebook, Twitter, or just go into iTunes and search for the podcast on Haunted Hill. So, are you going to ask me out? Mascotting is not unlike a marriage in that it's about cooperation. Mm -hmm. uh, it's about listening. Yeah. Um, it, it, even if people are screaming at you, you're not allowed to talk. And it, that's a good lesson for a marriage. Yeah. You know? Hundreds of mascots wanted to compete in this year's competition. We finally narrowed it down to 20 finalists. Danny the donkey, my mascot, was the first one to have an anatomically correct costume. You know, I was overcompensating. Classic overcompensation. I'm Alvin the Armadillo. I love all kinds of dancing. I can, I can hip hop. I can pop. I went to the Fluffies five years ago. I got honorable mention. That's like first place, really. But it's, it's a weird first place. My name is Tommy, also known as the Fist. A lot of people say I'm the bad boy of sports mascottery. To be fair, I am currently serving six temporary suspensions. I announced the gold category. I wrote a book and I got more applause than you did. Did they make you this size just to fit in the worm costume? No, they made me this size when I was born. Was... Oh, yeah, I see. I thought maybe they shrunk you down or something. No, it's not like that. Just tell me everything. This fascinates the hell out of me. She's a pencil. Emotions. So close to oh, me. Benny, the banana slug failed his drug test. What? <laughs> Have you been drinking today? Yes. No, yes. Laughing. <laughs> we have a drug problem and we got a sex problem. Hey, get Mascots, they don't die. They just hang in a closet. Yeah, because they're it's, it's an outfit. It is, it's an outfit. I'm crazy about you. That's really sweet. I'll take that over some guy, you know, defecating on my head. Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> uh welcome back to the beef anniversary uh the of the guest diverse nature i am back with the same three guys you heard last time mr cord Sive, mr Derek bourgeois and miss suzanne capoletti we're here to discuss 10 years later in the timeline uh netflix netflix exclusive you guys have netflix you guys can watch this no problem it's mascots from 2016 uh, written and directed by Christopher Guest. Um, it has many of the same faces you saw before, but here are some new faces that uh, you may not have seen before in these other movies. But um, your normal ones, uh, Jane Lynch shows up, of course. Uh, notably, uh, Christopher Guest comes back as Corky St. Clair from Waiting for Guffman. I have to mention that right away because it's uh, random. And Parker Posey may be her character from Guffman. Because she it's a, it's a different name. Maybe she changed her name. I don't know. We'll, we'll discuss that too. But uh, some new faces that you may know if you watch the IT crowd, you'll know Chris O'Dowd uh, comes comes out as uh, the Fist, Tommy Zuccarelli, uh as uh, one of the mascots. Oh, some some fun shit in here. <laughs> and I, I, I'm I'm gonna get right into this with these guys. Suzanne, what did you think of mascots in 2016? Mascots was a mixed bag for me. There were some great moments. There were some not-so-great moments. For me, it's Tammy the Turtle and her husband, and they are taking out all of their problems in their mascot suits. This shit is hilarious. Um, the Fist is my favorite, but I'm a huge hockey fan, and I'm all for people getting the crap beat out of them. <laughs> the Fist is pretty <laughs> awesome. <laughs> he is. But Chris Life, O'Dad, yeah. everything I've ever seen him in, he's just... He's great. Yeah, Chris O'Dowd's a joy. He is. I, I will actually watch Bridesmaids just because Chris O'Dowd's in it. The IT crowd, Gary got Pat a coffee cup 
that had a, and we tried turning it off and turning it back on again. I giggle every time I see it. You know, I do love just a little sidebar here. I absolutely love the IT crowd for putting that in people's heads after they've watched it because <laughs> there's actually been a marked improvement on helping people troubleshoot things because they said, I did try to restart the computer like right off the bat whenever I'm trying to troubleshoot software now. It's, it's fucking brilliant. Thank you, Chris O'Dowd. <laughs> and, 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 and the creators of IT crowd. Absolutely. Yes. But my problem, once again, it's once it's it's you you have interesting characters. My big issue is the fact that there's too many of them. You don't really get enough backstory. You don't. And that was the you know the beauty of the other movies. You get a you get a good chunk of backstory. This one falls short because there's so many people. And once again, we're just hitting that point where. It just seems like it's style over substance. I feel like with maybe half the cast, you really could have made a great go of this movie. You know, keep Tammy the turtle, you know, keep the plumber, because the plumber was hilarious. And once again, Fred Willard talking to God, that guy, I cannot remember that comedian's name. And he's like, oh yeah, let me go down into our tunnel. I'll blow the horn. That was fucking hilarious. That is probably the funniest bit in the movie. But this movie, once again, it just suffers. The Parker Posey, I, I have to admit, I got I got some issues. I rem, you know, at the very beginning of the movie, it's like, well, you're up for disqualification because people find that to be insensitive. And I mean, I know it's this was even before everything. It, it pisses everybody off, so you have to be completely p- politically correct at all times. But, I mean, there, there's good points and bad points. I'm not going to sit here and for 20 minutes and go off. But I think it suffers from too large of a cast. It seems like his little cameo as Corky St. Clair, it was kind of a, look, here I am taking Netflix money. I just don't think this one was completely thought out. It, there's too many holes in it for me. There's too many characters. There's too much going on without actually doing anything. It's just a, it's, for me, it's more like a talent show. And I'm just going to leave it there. Cool. Derek? Uh, yeah, it's, it's a little messy. I'll agree with that. But I actually really enjoyed this one, actually. Uh, I just like, you know, I just didn't know that there's like this, like, you know, this thing where they do like a thing where they say who's the best mascot in the world. It's kind of interesting that aspect because like, I never knew this was that. And my fucking favorite moments is when, you know, uh, Michael Hitchcock is just trying to find the furry. <laughs> 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 Very true. <laughs> We're all laughing. Oh, it's great. It, uh, the fist is my favorite because you know, like I, I seen this like a few years ago when it first came on Netflix, and I forgot that you know when he sticks the, I just started dying laughing when he sticks the middle finger up, and you just see the judges are only Ed Begley Jr. is the one enjoying the fucking act at all. <laughs> <He's> <laughs> like, yeah, offensive. I like it. Uh, I just love that backstory too that he is a actual anatomically correct donkey. <laughs> Well, and the reasoning that he did that is because he's overcompensating for a micro penis, and then he starts talking about like how people get into having ear sex because he has a micro penis and shit. And the side eye that Jane Lynch gives him during that is fucking brilliant. It's really funny. It's great. And yeah, I, I actually kind of agree that the scene where they take her and try, try to disqualify her, I see what they were doing because a lot of that was happening during that time period where you know, like. You know, like the Cleveland team and even the Washington team were kind of again speculated for the same reason. We can't reasons. even say the names anymore, can we? Well, it's, isn't it still a Washington football team? No, it's even... the Commanders now. Oh, okay. They actually got it. I'm like. And the Cleveland Guardians, and I'm sorry, I think it's straight up bullshit. Yeah, are they gonna like re- retroactively actually change Major League? <laughs> like, apparently they are. Are they George Lucas? produced oh god if they do i give up on films i will never watch another movie that's bullshit but yeah just buy the blu-ray now they're not going to change the blu-ray it's sitting in your house 
yeah, yeah that's it's, true. it's been there for a while you know but overall yeah it's a little messy but overall this is a good return to form after the last movie he did you know it's in the mockumentary style it has the interviews and uh, the fucking when they used to, and the turtle and the octopus that started fist fighting i was cracking up <laughs> no, that, that is one of the funniest scenes in the movie and fred willard and i can't stand the fact i forget that comedian's name like yeah i'll just go blow the horn and we all meet in our fucking burrow like oh my god and he, oh my god i just love you anyway and, and i just like the acts you know like even like the performances were interesting you know like the plumber one was great even the armadillo is weird, but I like it. So like, every, I love those the reactions of the <laughs> audience. They're like, "What the fuck?" I mean, I have to admit, the armadillo, complete with tire tracks, which Court pointed pointed out the other night. <laughs> I'm like, you know, I've seen that move. I've watched it three times, and yeah, all I see is tire tracks now. Yeah, <laughs> I think they were supposed to be scales, but they just look like they were tire tracks. Yeah, like she got no, ran no, over it was by tire, tire tracks. tracks. <laughs> I'm going with tire yeah. tracks that's my story and i'm sticking to it yeah like i just like those parts of it the most like the actual performances of the mascots it was actually interesting and even like the hedgehog one where he's just climbing you know it was just good performances from being a mascot you know and you know they, they were great and this movie's it's it's a fun return to form for christopher guest yeah he's just playing a cameo as corky for but I kind of like that, you know, it's in the same universe as Guffman, too, in that sense. Too. Ooh, like, oh, these movies are, this is my, you know, they're, it's the Christopher Guest-verse, you know. The guest verse Yeah. Court psyops. I will admit that everything that Suzanne and Derek had to say negative about the film, I kind of felt and was thinking the first time I watched it. Now, because scheduling didn't quite work out for us to record this when we wanted to, I did take another look at this last night before going to sleep. And I will say that the second time around, I found characters more engaging and I was actually able to latch on to certain stories. And I think similar to like a doctor documentary type movie, you can follow the individual interviews and pay attention to the certain people that you want to and follow their story and actually enjoy it a lot more. Uh, I paid attention this time very seriously to the hedgehog because I was blown away by that performance. And I made sure that I didn't say anything about it because I wanted to see if anybody else mentioned it. But that latter stunt work was super entertaining and was ultra cutesy and so fucking British. And the tea stuff and like he does everything that his dad always wanted him to do. And then he added his own little thing at the end. And the latter thing, I actually... When he fell over forward, the first time I watched it, even I was like, oh, shit. Like, I thought they were going to do a thing where he's actually going to get hurt. And then it turns out that's actually part of his routine. He had that set up. And I was like, oh, man, that fucking worked on me. I'm like, this guy's a great mascot. And the second time that I watched it, I'm doing the same thing where I'm really enjoying it. And I, I really had a great time with it. Now, granted, I still absolutely love the fist because, yes, I, too, am a hockey fan. And basically, the fist as a mascot is like the embodiment of the enforcer. And since those days are gone, seeing the mascot basically be an enforcer, he's literally the fist because that's what the fucking enforcers were for hockey. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> the, the routine, the, the I can't believe nobody else mentioned this, but my favorite part of his routine is he goes running off with the, the referee chasing him and you think the referee like ejected him from the auditorium or whatever and that's the end of the routine. Mm. And then next thing you know, there's another like guitar fucking hit with it explosions. He comes busting through the, the divider that actually has the competition's name on it, which I don't think he was supposed to do from the look of the way the judges were kind of upset about it. Takes a doll that represents the dead body of the referee. Flats it right on the table. <laughs> right in front of all the judges and then spins around and does the middle finger pop because he's not there to win a fucking trophy. That's not what that's about. He's there to show the crowd that he's the best and he fucking wins it in their hearts and that's all he cares about in his own head. I fucking and love that part too so that the the story with the hedgehog i want to come back to that i was following that this time and i found it very very touching because the father wouldn't let the guy be the hedgehog he wanted to be or the mascot that he wanted to be he kept trying to make it rooted in the tradition because the tradition is very important and the the, the not listening and the not communicating and the way that they grow as a family is really really great and if you actually remember that storyline and you enjoyed it 
I want to tell you that is very similar to some of the things that happen in the Christopher Guest series, Family Tree. Now, there's a lot of people that are in this movie that were in that series, Family Tree. I, I thought that I was the only one who watched Family Tree. I actually really liked it. I found it very touching and endearing, but it's not for everybody because it's a it's a hangout kind of TV show where you you follow Chris O'Dowd um, as he sort of like learns his genealogy of where he comes from. And he's a British man who apparently has an ancestor that comes from like the West of America. <laughs> and it's, it's really it's, bizarre and interesting. It's an interesting journey. Yeah. And I'm, I, I honestly forgot about it until you mentioned it, but yeah. I really enjoyed that. Well, I, what I would basically recommend to somebody is if you've seen family tree, then I think you would actually enjoy mascots if you haven't given it a chance. And if you've seen mascots and you thought it was pretty okay, but you like that hedgehog story, you would probably be a bigger fan of Family Tree for sure. And if you're just a fan of Chris and Dowd in general, you get to follow him around and he gets to be a sensitive guy. And it's one of those like awkward comedies where he's learning about his his past and, and who he is. So there you go. But back to mascots. By the end of it, whenever the father and the son reconcile with the stuff with the hedgehog, and then, you know, he ends up actually winning the trophy and he becomes the number one. I really, really love that. Yeah. And the complaint that I actually have about the competition stuff is if you're going to tell me that three mascots are one, two, and three, the best out of all of them across this whole globe competition you better show me all of the routines of the ones who win. Like, I want to know what happens with the rabbi and the worm because we don't get to see enough of it. Yeah. Like, to really, to, no, for that's, it to, that's so true. For, for it to be, for it to be number two, we should have been able to see it. Now, a nice explanation would have been Harry Shear basically saying that um, due to certain actions or whatever, the fist has been disqualified. And so that puts the, the worm. <laughs> the worm up or you know joe the plumber and the worm up or whatever you know whatever it is but like you should have whoever your your winners are we should get to see all of their routines so that we can also judge for ourselves you know? yeah for sure i yeah. agree and i agree with you 100 percent. but I, I do also love the fucking duking it out where the mascots are fighting like i think it would have been great if they would have had like a little model city that they sort of started stomping on to be like all <laughs> kaijuing it up while they're fighting yeah yeah, I think I think that would have been fucking great. I really do. But like that's that's just because I always want to see fucking people in monster outfits stomping on city sets. So <laughs> I, I, I hear you there, man. <laughs> but anyway, yeah, that's that's basically my impression of it. So I think if you guys give it another watch and I don't I tried this for for your consideration, but I, I it didn't work for me. And mascots I watched specifically for this show both times. And the second time around, I think I, I really enjoyed it more. So I, I think like coming into it with that perspective of just following certain people that you did like and seeing their story and or maybe giving somebody else's story a chance if you like notice that you didn't really recognize them from before. It helps because, yes, there is a lot of fucking people, but I think he did that on purpose where he had the money and he's like, you know what? I want to give everybody I fucking know a job. <laughs> uh, <yeah. laughs> so I'm OK with that. Yeah, some of the bits that um, weren't mentioned so far, there's a there's a one of the mascot bits to where there's a pencil and a sharpener that's overly, overly sexualized in this movie, and um, it's hilarious. <laughs> it's pretty fucking great. <laughs> <laughs> just just picture what we're talking the, about. The, the, one chick was a, sorry. the one the one chick that was a John Michael Higgins. He's like she's like I like the pencil. <laughs> <laughs> pencil and the sharpener is all I'll say about that one. Um. Yeah, the hedgehog story is one of the best stories of the, of the movie, and especially you know because he's like this neurotic dude because his dad was like this legend in, in the hedgehog outfit, and he doesn't want it to go against the grain. He wants to keep it, keep it, keep it tight, keep it the same, but he wants to do this bit with the ladder, and there's a lot of suspense built with the ladder bit, and it wouldn't have happened without, of course, the conversation he has with, with the fist, uh, Tommy Zuccarello, and um. That that's a great scene. You know, basically telling them to do, go go. Yeah. Do your I own, forgot go, to mention that, Carrie. Go do your own thing. I'm sorry you know? to interrupt you. No, you're okay. I'm sorry to interrupt you, but like I forgot to mention that. Yeah, that was a really touching scene, and it was actually really nice because you get to see the man behind the character that he plays because he's the fist twenty four seven on camera, and just that brief moment where he's talking to him and just connecting with him on a very human level, and he just basically tells him like, "Why can't you be your own man? What's stopping you?" You know, like, and he just gives him that beautiful little pep talk without even fucking trying. 
Because he literally just doesn't understand why he just doesn't do it. <laughs> mm-hmm. And the result is great. I mean, I'm so glad. There, there, I mean, there's, you have to admit, a lot these tales, there's a lot to these stories. And I, I seriously, I, I was thinking a lot about the hedgehog story. And I didn't quite realize how much I was actually in touch with the hedgehog story until Court started bringing it up. Yeah, but yeah, I agree. There's, there's so much there, and it just seems like Family Tree was an extension of that. See, I gotta watch Family Tree now. See, I, I, gotta look for I that. haven't seen that either, and I want to watch it. It was an HBO yeah. series, so it should be on HBO Max. Everything they've ever done, I think, is on there that they cool. still have. Yeah, to. And Ooh, I know I'm watching later. It, it, I was really surprised because it, I didn't even, it didn't even cross my mind until you mentioned it. So thank you. Oh, Sarah Baker, who plays the turtle, uh, a.k.a. Mindy Murray, in this movie. I've seen her in stuff before, and she always makes me laugh, uh, especially in, um, if you guys have seen the campaign, she plays uh, Zach Galifianakis' wife in that movie, who's all whoring up for Will Ferrell. And, she's and, fucking hilarious. And Bob Barker in that movie. <laughs> it's very funny. She is hilarious. That's my that's my stupid funny movie right there, the campaign. They're, they're, they're weird trying to make out scene at the end of it. Yeah, like, yeah. They were. <laughs> that is so cringy. It's like, well, a year ago we would not have been able to do this. You can see they're just like, oh god, if your if your lips touch me, I'm gonna vomit. But the camera's here, so okay, moi. Oh, so good. Uh, if you haven't seen the, the fist is one. after. <laughs> the fist is just a monk now. <laughs> who's breaking his vow of silence to do an interview because he can't fucking help it. He's like, fuck it. <laughs> oh, God, motherfucking Jim. Yeah. God. yeah, that's what's back in this one. You get that great, you know, end, you know, what, what are they doing now? And it's not mean-spirited, you know. You, you got that. You got a little bit of that and um, pretty much the aftermath of them not getting nominated for your consideration. Like I said, mean-spirited as hell. I'm sorry. Actually, the only downer part of that whole aftermath thing is the Parker Posey story where they're just working at an old age home for mascots and they have a mascot funeral. I'm like, whoa. This yeah, but that's just oh, yeah. a part of that's a part of the mascot life cycle. And like they said, they don't have to they don't have to worry about mascots dying pretty much. They can basically just hang on the shelf. It's the people underneath or something like that. Yeah. They get a little philosophical with it. Yeah. Yeah, it was pretty yeah, it was very interesting. Uh, it's just weird to see an elephant in a casket, though. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think that's going to be quite a heavy burial fee. Yeah. Oh, gosh. Oh, the, the little shit in this movie. Fred Willard doesn't get a whole lot to do with this movie, but he, the part where he's talking to, to the worm, who's, who's a little person, and he's just fascinated that a little person can do this, and it's, um, it's so random. How were you made this way? I was made this way by birth. <laughs> <laughs> the way that, the, like, I'm gonna go down in the burrow and I'm gonna blow the horn. I, I love that. <laughs> I love that he doesn't actually start giving him shit because, like, he realizes the guy probably is legitimately just never seen a little person before in his life and has no idea that he's being that much of a prick. Yeah. <laughs> but like at the end, when he's obviously saying stuff that's really offensive, I love the way that that guy just gives him shit right back to yeah. prove how much of an idiot he is. And I love when. Fred Willard realizes it and then decides to end the conversation because he's like, "You're fun in me, aren't you?" It reminds me of it, but I, this I don't care. You're a great, you're a great little guy. It reminds me of the scene in Blast from the Past, but this is a lot more naive because he actually never seen one before. When um, Brendan Fraser oh. comes up to the surface, he's like, "Wow, a black woman! I've never seen one of those before." Where he, where he says, "You know," but that's that's a lot more fascinating because he actually never he, seen one before. Yeah, he, you know? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> You know, the dialogue and that, that scene may be, you know, problematic to slip but those people don't know what good writing is, though. That's a uh, that's a guy I, I feel has never been, I think I didn't like, Brendan Fraser, so. <laughs> you win, oh. buddy. You win. <laughs> I, I love when he, like, orders a drink and he's like, don't hookers drink that? Ma sure likes them. My mom sure likes them. With the, the, the Rob Roy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, so good. This is this, this is good too, though. I mean, I, like uh, a lot of folks say, it's a return to form, and I I will agree. For, from the last movie we saw, it is. It, you you get back to you know what made these movies a lot of fun and really great. You know the, that na- naivety that's there about this this culture that may or may not be sexually motivated. Because I, I love the the the, the rabid yeah. furry is in the hotel because you know there's <laughs> going to be that one guy looking for shit like that. You know. 
Yeah, and he represents like a very small, very just desperate person, like just one person. It's just like one dude that's like that. It's not the entirety of the furry community. And I just love the way that the guy's trying to like basically tell him how to react whenever a furry is trying to scritch him uh-huh. or whatever that he's doing and like what what the what the words are to say and he's like how about i'll tell him i'll punch him in the fucking mouth or something like that <laughs> <laughs> i love that line delivery but if you are if... randomly off topic but... but not off topic um one of my a friend of a friend who i'm a friend apparently we're friends he didn't know what his sexuality was didn't know how he felt about anything, but he actually found, God help me, a fursona. And I'm like, you know what? I'm really happy for you that you found a happy place for yourself. But my God, if I hear about a scratch pile one more time, I'm going to be sick. <laughs> wow. <laughs> we got 10 minutes left. Okay, yeah, we'll, uh, we'll wrap this up. <laughs> Furries aside, uh, Mr. Court, final thoughts and what's your rating, sir? Uh, it's not my absolute favorite of all the Christopher Guest uh, series and or films that I've seen, but um, after realizing why I knew so much of the cast that I didn't know where from came from Family Tree, I really started enjoying it more on that second watch. So I'm going to give it a seven because it's not the best, but it's definitely more than just a movie. And I found it very entertaining. And I think probably if I watch it again, it might go up at least a half a point, if not another, you know, because I'll find something else that I will really enjoy about it. And I definitely would check it out again because, I mean, as long as I got the Netflix subscription, I can watch it as much as I want. Cool. Derek? Yeah, I really enjoyed this for what it was, you know. It it kept me interested enough. I was engaged with what was going on within the movie. And, you know, just the whole, you know, it was just interesting. Like, mascots, I was always interested as a kid anyways, like when I went to games and shit. So this is kind of interesting to me. And... It has some great funny moments. The fucking furry. <laughs> Hilarious. <laughs> Anyways, I'll give it like a 7.5 out of 10. I really enjoyed it. Suzanne. No, honestly, I for me, I just think that there are too many players in the movie. But the stories that he focused on were incredibly, you know, part of them were endearing. Part of them were just hilarious. But I honestly think a 7.5 is pretty apt. Yeah, I'm right with you with with Court with the seven. I I enjoyed myself much more than the last one, and that's um the five to the seven. It doesn't sound like much of an upgrade, but it'll take you a couple more times. And I think um watching this Family Tree show, which I'm gonna watch very very soon, uh will, will get you to enjoy a whole yeah, lot more out of this too. movie. And um I'm looking forward to watching you that. Should do then. a bonus episode. Yeah, maybe. Huh? <laughs> yeah, we should. Yeah, I don't mind that. We should. It's Christopher Gas. I don't mind that at all. Um. But yeah, that's about it for this one, and we'll uh, see y'all again when we come close up the show. This'll keep you quiet. Oh, hi there. I didn't see you. You caught me cutting a new show. I'm Bo Ransdell, and I'm one of the many creators you can find on Legion Podcasts. I said quiet! My fellow podcasters and I work hard to bring you the best in horror podcasting, but that comes at a cost. What's that? Not that, but also, yes. No, what I'm getting at is that there are server costs, costs for good microphones and software for editing, all the things that make our shows, you know, fun to listen to. And you can help. If you're enjoying the shows on legionpodcasts.com or in the Legion Network available on iTunes and Stitcher, just about anywhere you can download a podcast, really, you can help us out and get a little something for your trouble at patreon.com forward slash legionpodcasts. For just two bucks a month, you get a pair of movie commentaries exclusive to Patreon. And for five dollars, you can also join us for a monthly screening of a movie. All of that available on Patreon.com forward slash Legion Podcasts. We appreciate it and thank you for listening. Now, back to the cutting room. All right. um, That is the end of the show. The end of the journey of of nine years of Cine Beef Podcast. And I, I just want to say, uh, go go back, and it, it, it bears repeating. I, I'm I'm only as good as the people I work with, and the, that's Iris, that's Suzanne, that's Jamie, that's everybody here on this show. Je- Jeffrey X. Martin, Ricky Morgan, Derek Bourgeois, Court Psyops. Uh, I'll name some more uh, Legion people for sure. Uh, Darren Wilson, 
got Kate and Matt, the Eternal, Eternal uh, Darkness of the Not So Spotless Mind podcast, Kill the Cast, Jerry and the Boys. You, you got Friday Nightmares, uh, the, the very lovely Heather and, and her, her lackey, Scott. Uh, I, I say that with love, Scott. She, she loves like, to bust your balls and vice versa. And, you know, all these people that, um, I saw like, get the hook, motherfucker, get the hook. But no, all these people are important. These guys have been doing it forever and ever. Gentleman's Guide to Midnight Cinema have been doing this forever. Be- um, outside the cinema has been doing this forever. Mike White and the Projection Booth have been doing this forever. And there's a reason for the season of the Sleasons is that if they didn't enjoy what they do, if they did, if I didn't enjoy what the fuck I do on this show, I would not still be doing it. I've always said that if it felt like a job, I, I, I would not be be uh, be doing this. I would not be attempting to do this. And it never felt like a job. People have always, you know, worked with me, and I, I hoped had a good time on the show and are going to continue to have a good time on the show. Again, I'm making it sound like a real swan song, but I should not do that because it's not. I'm... I'm I'm gonna get some some beautiful content out to you people with with the help of some some great friends. Uh, speaking of wonderful content, their next Cinem Beef podcast that will come out will be the Little Bill Double Bill, and I'll explain this to you guys if you guys didn't hear about it before. This is a film. Re- this is a review show. A review. Uh, a review show. This is a podcast uh, programming that we, we brought two c- characters together, both called Little Bill. Um, Unforgiven, uh, which is a western that you guys may or may not know. I hope you guys know. It's a wonderful film. Uh, features little Bill Daggett, who is Gene Hackman. And Boogie Nights, from 1987, features little Bill, uh, portrayed by Bill, uh, by Bill, by, his name is Bill, too. His name is Bill, too. William H. Macy, uh, plays little Bill in Boogie Nights, so... Put the two together, you get two wonderful films, and I'm sure some great conversation. We have not recorded the reviews yet as of this recording, these little end caps, because truth be told, behind the scenes, this is all recorded in pieces, and I'm just piecing this all together, because piecemealing is the way to go, people. If, um, again, only as good as people I work with. If, if, if uh, that, that, that ship uh, was was not there, was was not righted in, in the right way, I... I um, I wouldn't be able to, 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 to do this. I mean, a lot of these guys, they, they've gone the simplistic way of editing. Uh, Duncan McLeish doesn't do a whole lot to, to, to the recording because he's fucking on it. Mike Murphy, does, he's on it, man. He's on it. He just, just goes for it. And I, I would love to think that I could do that, but I, I, do, I don't have, I, I need to use filters. And stuff. My, my voice is kind of terrible, and it's only better because I use filters or whatnot. <laughs> Um, but yeah, this has been nine years of this show. Um, look for some other shows, uh, amongst the, the butcher shop, um, family of shows, the Legion podcast family of shows, go donate to the Legion podcast, Patreon. It's as low as $2 a month and you get early releases, all the bonus torches episodes. There's about 10 of those by now where we've read anything from our first review of the drive. We reviewed the Wanderers for the the match with the Warriors. Um, we just reviewed Code of Silence to to, to go with Red Heat. Uh, they're, they're, there's they're, they're all paired together like like a fine wine with with, with pasta, and I, I I think that um yeah this podcasting gig is my my fine wine with wonderful pasta. It just uh you, you guys uh you guys bring the gabagool every time. Uh, although you guys don't show us sometimes and say hey. I, I really enjoy that show, but you know what? I got some feedback from Robert Ward, who listened to our Black Roses two screen minimum commentaries, and you know what? That 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 little bit of commenting, you know, can really bring a can really make it all worthwhile. Uh, speaking of which, go go uh, go go check us out on Apple Apple Apple, Apple Music Apple uh, Podcasts Apple whatever it is. Leave us a rate and review, uh, one star review, five star review. Just let us know you're there. We, we we would love it. If I get to 30 reviews, they come to like 18 right now. I'm going to give something away. How about that? And uh, this is the first place that I will announce the exact date when the Fleas and Flicks charity auction is going to happen. Some of you guys are asking, what what is this? Some some new listeners, perhaps, the ones that don't know. Uh, well, I'll tell you what it is. It's a, it's a charity auction, which I've, I've gathered many items from 
different Hollywood people that he made at conventions and different donations from different people. And this is uh, cinema stuff. This is wrestling stuff. Uh, mostly autograph stuff. Uh, but the only autograph thing I, I not autograph thing I have in the, in the bunch is a a Raphael. Um, I think he's a, a Frankenstein figure, Raphael Fair Frankenstein figure from the Ninja Turtles, and a Andre the Giant pop vinyl from the Princess Bride Fezzik, which was an Amazon exclusive, and I think that was a uh, he's going for a pr- pretty penny right now. So you guys might want to go after that, and he's oversized and adorable. He's a rock in his hand. But um, March 11th and 12th, I believe it is. It's Saturday and Sunday. Now the way this works is I'm gonna set up a event page on the Facebooks, which is the easy way to do this. You can go when you see me pop up and I'll be I'll be trolling everywhere with this thing to get you to get your monies. It goes to a, a no kill shelter, like I said. And um I will have all the items listed the the, the day of when it's gonna when it's gonna start. And uh when I say start bidding, you guys can start bidding and, and you bid in the comment section. Some some higher end items, some some lower end items whatever it, whatever you guys can give if you guys can give it all goes to uh, uh the no kill shelter south Sub- south suburban humane society in in beautiful T- tinley park illinois and they have other subsidiaries too in that area and it's a good thing to to, to help to help animals to help just to help people in general and uh I, I don't need to tell you this but you can get some cool shit in the process uh, like like this fawn figure I'm staring at right now, this NECA old fawn figure from Pan's Labyrinth, signed by the nicest monster that ever lived, Doug Jones. You know, he played all the monsters in that movie, but this is a fawn figure. And um, he's excited for you guys to have it. He's very excited for you guys to have it. I'll, I'll share the video. Um, again, excited to be here, excited to keep doing this after nine years. I'm going in the 10th year, uh, my, my, my nipples are getting hard just thinking about it. Because um, my 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 brother from another mother, Jeffrey X. Martin, who you heard her earlier on the show, coming back, we kissed the goat, tease tease, poke poke. Uh, he 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 spilled the beans this week uh, in in a way that him and Cootie are getting back together again and going to do something. So, probably kiss the goat. I'm I'm, I'm looking forward to it and uh, looking forward to everything. Just just life in general. If if you're in the shits like I am every holiday season, if you're in the shits right now, you know. Reach out to your buddy. I'll, I'll, I'll talk to you. you know, we, we we could be in the shits together and maybe make each other, maybe lift each other up, you know. So I'm trying to stay out of the shits so I could release more content to you. And I'm I'm going on and on and on here. And I don't care because I'm on the microphone by myself. And if y'all are still listening, God bless you. Or crime bless you. Or many blessings. You know, good health. Good, good beer good food, all of the above. Nothing but love here, but this is where I will leave it. Do all those things that are, that are asked of you, if possible. Uh, if not, no pressure, okay? Pressure is bad. Pressure makes people go crazy and possibly hurt somebody in their office building. and that, That's that's no-go, man. I, I'm over pressure. I'm over it, man. Just, uh, I'm here for, for cinema and, and my people and you guys are people. I, I I go to horror conventions and I, you walk in a room. It's it's almost like a church. You can s- smell the air. And you say, "Yep, these are my people," and I feel comfortable. Well, when I'm on this show, and I know some of you guys are listening to the show, you're my people, and I am comfortable with you, and love it. Love you guys. Love the show. Love to Jamie, Iris, Suzanne, everybody that works with me. And it works, you know, and not for me. It's for me, no, because I, I, I think I'm the boss of this, this, this little ride. But I'm not. I'm only as good as people I work with. I, I'll say this 14 more fucking times, okay? You know why? Because they make me better. And it, that's that's plain and simple, uh, clear as crystal, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, de facto, de jure, uh, all, all, all those things. But this is where I'll leave you. This has been. The ninth anniversary beef anniversary show of the Sin Beef Podcast, where if you've got beef, we've all got the grinder. Love you guys.